Strawberry Caramel Murder, A Bitsy's Bake Shop Culinary Cozy. Book 3. By Celia Kinsey Writing as Abby Bine. You are listening to an AI narration. If you would prefer to purchase an ebook or paperback version, you can find the link in the description. Chapter 1. Who is Monica McCall? Annabel asked Bitsy as she scanned the newspaper clipping Bitsy had just posted on the tiny bulletin board next to the bakery refrigerator. She's a local food blogger, but she also occasionally does articles for the Fayetteville newspaper. Didn't she give us a great write-up? Bitsy replied. She certainly is enthusiastic about our strawberry caramel cupcakes. Yes, her review is so effusive it's almost embarrassing. Bitsy's Bake Shop offers the best cupcakes I've ever tasted, Annabel read aloud. Keep going, said Bitsy, it gets even better. A mouthful of heaven. Keep going. Once I'd tasted one of Bitsy's cupcakes, I knew I was ready to die a happy woman, Annabel continued reading. I thought that was going a bit far, Bitsy said, and given our bakery's track record of being involved in murders, slightly unwise. They are good, though, aren't they? Bitsy spoke with her mouth full of strawberry caramel cupcake. I can see why this flavor quickly became our best-selling item. It was genius of you to think up that combination. Annabel shrugged off the compliment, embarrassed at having her contribution recognized. I wish the article had mentioned you, Bitsy continued. I hate taking credit where it isn't due. Annabel quickly changed the subject. Did you hear that creepy guy tried to attack another woman with scissors and cut her hair off in the grocery store parking lot last night? Bitsy had not heard, but it didn't surprise her. Last night's incident made the sixth time in the last two weeks that the scissor-wielding assailant had attacked someone. So far, all his victims had been women, and they'd all managed to fight him off with nothing more than minor injuries. Bitsy hoped he'd be caught soon. Little Creek, Arkansas, was not exactly a hotbed of crime. Bad things did happen from time to time, just like they did everywhere, but random attacks were extremely rare. Bitsy had always felt so safe in the tiny town, she didn't like to think she, or any other woman, needed to be constantly on her guard. Did the woman get a good look at the guy this time? Bitsy asked. So far, none of his victims had gotten a good look at his face. He always attacked from behind, and he always wore a cap and sunglasses, even the two times he'd struck after dark. No, unfortunately, said Annabel. One of my girl cousins works at that grocery store. I wish they'd hurry up and catch him. It's making me nervous. I could use another tray of strawberry caramels out there if you've got any ready yet, Hector said, returning from the front of the shop with an empty tray. What's making you nervous? Annabel? That haircutting creep struck again in the grocery store parking lot. He didn't succeed, I hope. Yes and no, the woman got away with only a couple of small scratches, but there's a chunk missing out of the back of her hair. I'm just about to go and sit there in that parking lot until I catch him, said Hector. And when I do? It is a thought, said Bitsy. I'm worried that sooner or later, he's going to seriously injure someone. Who's going to seriously injure someone? Nick asked, coming in the door. That weirdo who's been grabbing women out of parking lots and giving them involuntary haircuts, Bitsy answered. Oh, where did he strike this time? Nick asked. The grocery store, said Annabel. So far, that's twice at the drugstore, once in the parking lot of Pietro's Pizza, once near the pond at the park, and, with what happened last night, twice at the grocery store said Nick. He's certainly persistent. Why does a person do something like that? No one answered Nick. Bitsy had a pretty good idea why a man might go around cutting hair off strange women, but she didn't want to get into that in the middle of her sunny bakery, which smelled of vanilla, chocolate, caramel, and strawberries. Let the weirdos of the world stay out there somewhere, preferably outside of Little Creek altogether. Since everyone is here, said Bitsy, I might as well take the opportunity to tell you I'll be out tomorrow. Doing something fun, I hope, said Annabel. Not really. I have to get some cavities filled, Bitsy replied. I'm sure you will all do just fine without me here, but
But there is one thing, I told Monica McCall, the blogger who did that glowing write-up on us, to come by tomorrow morning around 10 and pick up a dozen strawberry caramel cupcakes as a thank you. Isn't that kind of like a bribe? Nick joked. A bribe is something you get before you agree to do something, Bitsy pointed out. Oh, so more like a payment, Nick persisted, grinning at her. Nick's grin was infectious, and Bitsy had to force herself not to smile back. Instead, she picked a rag up off the counter and tossed it at him, but he caught it in his hand before it hit him in the face and kept right on grinning. No one, Bitsy decided, had a right to be that good-looking. She still couldn't believe she and Nick were seeing each other and had been for over a month now. Annabelle assured Bitsy she'd make sure Monica got her cupcakes as Bitsy collected her coat and shoved a knitted hat over her unruly curls. That was another thing, besides the dentist, she'd been putting off. She was way overdue for a haircut. Nick followed Bitsy out the door and toward her parking place in the alley, behind the bakery. You didn't tell me you had a dentist appointment tomorrow, he said reproachfully. Just because we're dating, said Bitsy, doesn't mean I have to tell you everything. Nick laughed. You want to have dinner tomorrow evening? he asked. Sure, shall we cook, or do you want to go out? I thought I might introduce you to my mother. Bitsy's heart sank into her shoes. She and Nick had only been together since Thanksgiving, and it wasn't even Valentine's Day yet. Nick's mother had been out of town for Thanksgiving, and Bitsy had gone down to Texas to visit her daughter Emily for Christmas, so she and Nick had yet to navigate a family occasion as a couple. Bitsy wasn't at all sure she was ready to meet Nick's mother. Uh, said Bitsy, stalling for time. Does she really want to meet me? Of course, she does. Don't worry, she'll love you. Bitsy was far from sure Nick's mother would love her. For one thing, there was a ten-year age difference between her and Nick. This had yet to pose a problem for them, personally, but Bitsy was worried meeting Nick's mother might change all that. Nick's mother had given birth to him when she was only 18, which made her a mere 58 to Bitsy's 50. Have you told your mom about me? Bitsy asked. Of course. I mean, what have you told her about me? I told her how great you are, how you run the bakery, how you like to. Have you told her how old I am? There. She'd come right out and said it. I don't know, Nick said, looking mildly surprised. Maybe. I'm not sure it's ever come up. Don't you think she might be shocked? Shocked? Why? It had clearly never occurred to him his mother might have any misgivings about their relationship. I think you should prepare yourself for the possibility your mother may, um, find our relationship somewhat hard to understand. I don't see why, Nick insisted. He looked mildly insulted Bitsy should even consider his mother might find their relationship odd. She shouldn't worry, Bitsy told herself. Maybe, Nick was right. Maybe, his mother wouldn't care at all that Bitsy was a decade older than Nick. After all, Nick knew his mother much better than she did. Still, she couldn't help feeling apprehensive. All too often, sad experience had taught her, men were very poor predictors of how their mothers would feel about their son's taste in women. I'd rather we went out to eat, said Bitsy. If she was going to meet Nick's mother, the least she could do was insist on neutral ground. And maybe we should wait until the day after tomorrow. After spending the morning at the dentist, I might not be up to dinner out. Sure, Nick said. Day after tomorrow, then. We can go to that new Russian restaurant in Fayetteville, we keep saying we want to try. The next morning Bitsy was late for her dentist appointment. It was a bad habit she had developed. The more she didn't want to go through with something, the later she was in arriving. It was irrational. No matter how late she arrived, she would still need those three fillings, and now, in addition to inconveniencing her dentist, she had probably also caused another patient to be delayed for their appointment. Time operated like a set of dominoes. Her lateness could trigger a whole set of unforeseen changes in the days of countless other people. But, as it turned out, she had been beating herself up over nothing. When she arrived at the dentist's office 20 minutes late for her scheduled appointment, 
she found the office manager and two hygienists huddled in an agitated conference behind the reception counter. I should have called you, said the office manager once Bitsy managed to get her attention. The dentist won't be seeing patients this morning. Oh, said Bitsy. I hope Dr. Barton isn't ill. No, said one of the hygienists. Nothing like that, she just got a nasty scare this morning, so she decided to go home for the day. Nasty scare? Some guy tried to get into her car, out in the parking lot, when she arrived for work this morning. That's terrible, said Bitsy. No wonder she doesn't feel up to working today. Bitsy certainly didn't want a jittery dentist wielding a drill anywhere near her teeth. It's probably that same one, said the receptionist. You know that scissor-wielding guy who grabbed that lady in the grocery store parking lot a couple of days ago and cut off a piece of her hair? Did Dr. Barton get a good look at him? Bitsy asked. She did. He was wearing a hat and sunglasses, just like he was the other times, but this time he finally got caught on tape. We have a security camera out front, and Dr. Barton's parking spot is right underneath it. Yeah, one of the hygienists chimed in. They're going to show it on the local news tonight. See if anyone recognizes the guy. Since she wasn't getting fillings, after all, Bitsy decided she might as well go to the bakery. It was almost eleven, but there would still be plenty to do to get the morning bake put out in the display cases. When she walked in the back door, Annabel was surprised to see her. I thought you were going to the dentist, said Annabel. Did he change his mind about giving you fillings? She, actually, said Bitsy. I go to Jane Barton. Dr. Barton went home early today. That guy we were talking about yesterday. The creepy scissor dude? Yeah. This morning, he tried to get into Jane Barton's car, just after she pulled into her parking spot at her office. That's scary, said Annabel. Fortunately, he didn't hurt her. He didn't even get away with a piece of her hair. On another bright note, the police finally have security camera footage of him. They're going to run the images on the news tonight. Maybe someone will recognize him. I hope so, said Bitsy. By the way, did Monica stop by and pick up her cupcakes? She did. She stopped by just a little after ten. At a quarter till six that evening, just as Bitsy and Nick were getting ready to shut off the lights and lock the doors, the phone next to the register rang. Bitsy's bake shop, Bitsy said into the receiver. Bitsy expected the person on the other end to ask if they were still open, but instead, the caller identified himself as Dale McCall. I'm Monica McCall's husband, he said, sounding nervous. I was wondering if you could tell me if Monica was by there earlier today? Yes, said Bitsy. She came by to pick up a box of cupcakes. What time? Around ten. You're sure? Pretty sure. I didn't see her myself, but one of my bakers did. There was a long pause on the other end of the line. Is something wrong? Bitsy asked. Yeah, said Dale. She hasn't come home yet, and I'm starting to worry. Oh? When did you expect her? We were supposed to meet for lunch, but she didn't show up. Did she call? No. That's the thing. I haven't been able to reach her all day. She left home to run errands right after breakfast this morning, and I haven't seen or heard from her since. Chapter 2 Bitsy called Monica McCall's cell phone number first thing the following morning. Bitsy hadn't slept well. It was premature to worry, she told herself. Maybe, Dale and Monica were going through a rough patch in their relationship, and Monica had decided to take a day for herself. Maybe, Monica had run into unforeseen delays while she was out running errands. Maybe her phone had run out of battery, or she'd accidentally switched it off. Probably, Monica had shown up later in the evening, and they'd all been worried for nothing. Bitsy almost managed to convince herself there was no need for concern, but didn't quite succeed. There was no answer from Monica's cell phone. It rang and rang until Monica's cheerful, recorded voice invited her to leave a message. Bitsy hung up and dialed the number Dale had left her, 
just in case. He answered on the first ring. I was just calling to check and make sure Monica is okay, Bitsy explained. I don't know, said Dale, his voice shaking. I still haven't heard from her. Has anyone else? Not that I know of, Dale answered. As far as I can figure out, your baker was the last person to see her yesterday. She left the house and went to the dry cleaners and the drugstore. People at both places remember seeing her there before 10, but after she left the bakery, she just disappeared. Did you have a fight? Bitsy hated to pry, but under the circumstances, she didn't know what else to do. No, said Dale. And even if we had, there's no way she would have just taken off. She's not the kind to do something like that. Has she been depressed at all? Bitsy asked. No. Dale answered. He sounded a little angry. I'm sorry, I know you're trying to help, but... Have you reported her missing? I called the police station first thing this morning. They told me to bring down a picture. I'm going down there right now. Well, I won't keep you on the phone, then, said Bitsy. Dale hung up with a terse goodbye. Bitsy couldn't read him. Was he defensive because he was stressed, or did he have something to hide? Then there was another terrible, yet obvious, possibility, the same man who'd tried to get into Jane Barton's car yesterday morning might have struck again and succeeded in doing more than cutting off a lock of hair this time. Bitsy sat down on the edge of her bed, her shaking hand clutched around her phone. What am I going to do, Max, she wailed. Bitsy's cat, Max, just looked up at her with his big yellow eyes, supremely unhelpful. She had to do something, Bitsy decided. She'd get a picture of Monica and go looking for the missing woman herself. Tracking down a picture of Monica couldn't have been easier. In fact, there were so many to choose from on Monica's blog that Bitsy selected three and saved them to her phone. She wished she'd asked Dale for a description of the vehicle Monica had been driving on the day she disappeared, but Bitsy didn't like to disturb him a second time. Dale was probably down at the police station at that very moment, filing a missing person's report. Instead, Bitsy settled for calling up Annabelle to see if anyone at the bakery might have gotten a good look at the car Monica had been driving when she'd come by the previous morning to pick up the cupcakes. Annabelle didn't know anything, but she thought Nick might, so she put him on the line. It was a dark Ford SUV, said Nick. I was out front washing windows when she pulled up. That's the only reason I got a good look at it. Black, or maybe dark blue. I'm not good with colors. It was really dusty, though, and I remember noticing a big crack across the front windshield. Anything else? Nothing I can think of at the moment, said Nick. She still hasn't been heard from? No, said Bitsy. I'm getting a little worried she hasn't shown up or even called or anything. Maybe she doesn't want to be found? Nick suggested. You mean like she ran away or something? Yeah. Doesn't that happen a lot, women running away from bad relationships? I don't know about a lot, said Bitsy. I don't. That's what you encouraged Annabelle to do a few months back, Nick pointed out. When her boyfriend was beating up on her. Yes, but that was different. How do you know? She didn't know, Bitsy realized. She didn't know anything about Monica except what she'd learned about her from reading her blog or the occasional pieces she wrote for the Fayetteville paper. Someone could present a very inaccurate view of their life through the lens of a blog post or a newspaper column. Bitsy had never even met Dale. Her knowledge of Dale was limited to a couple of short phone conversations and a quick internet search, which had yielded the not terribly enlightening information he was a building contractor, the McCall half of McCall and Schmidt Custom Homes. Maybe, Monica had run away. That was a realistic possibility. However, if she hadn't left voluntarily, it was almost certain she was now in grave danger. Bitsy didn't even want to think of the third possibility, Monica might be dead. Bitsy? You still there? Nick's voice on the other end of the phone brought her back to reality. I have to look for her, said Bitsy. I just have to. Okay, said Nick. But be careful. 
I don't see any harm in going around to local businesses asking if anyone's seen her, but if things start to feel sketchy. Are you worrying about me? Bitsy teased. Do you think I can't take care of myself? Yes, said Nick. I am worried about you. I plan to have you around for a long time. Bitsy didn't know what to say to that. She and Nick had never talked about the future, and she wasn't ready to even start thinking about it. And don't forget, said Nick, we're having dinner this evening with my mother. Bitsy had forgotten. She'd been so worried about the missing Monica she'd forgotten about how much she was dreading being given the once-over by Nick's mother. Bitsy had a sinking feeling she was going to be found wanting, but she couldn't see that any good would come of voicing her fears. Don't worry, said Bitsy. I'll be ready by 6.15. Nobody had seen Monica. At least not after she'd left the bakery. Louise, the girl who worked the register at the drugstore, looked at Monica's picture and said, her husband came in yesterday afternoon, looking for her. That's sad she's still missing. He seemed super worried about her. According to Louise, Monica had come in around 9.30. She'd purchased aspirin and a bottle of shampoo. That was hardly illuminating information, other than Monica might have had a headache at the time, and she was in the habit of washing her hair. Oh, said Louise, just as Bitsy was leaving. I didn't think to tell her husband this, but Monica was here for quite a while. She stood in one of the aisles and chatted with another woman. Could you hear what they were talking about? Anything about what she might have been planning to do later in the day? No, said Louise. I didn't hear anything like that. I wasn't really listening closely. I think Monica was mostly talking about her mother. What about her? She seemed worried about her mother. I heard her say something about how she wasn't going to let them get away with it. Away with what? I don't know, said Louise, but whatever it was, she seemed to be getting pretty mad about it. Finally, thought Bitsy, now she was getting somewhere. Do you know who it was Monica was talking to? Bitsy asked. I don't know her name, said Louise. But I think she works as a checker at the grocery store. Louise thought the checker was in her late twenties, with long brown hair and brown eyes. That wasn't much to go on, but Bitsy headed to the grocery store anyway. When she got there, none of the checkers fit Louise's description, but Bitsy got in line with a small basket of items, nonetheless. After the pleasant-looking, gray-haired checker had rung up her purchases and Bitsy had swiped her credit card, she held up her phone with a picture of Monica displayed on the screen. Have you seen this woman in the last few days? Bitsy asked the checker. She looks familiar, the checker answered, but I don't know as I've seen her recently. Thanks, said Bitsy, collecting her bags. Wait, said the checker. Ralph might know. She took the phone out of Bitsy's hand and held it up for the young male checker working the next register. Oh, that's Katie's friend, said Ralph. Katie? She works here, Ralph continued. If you come back at noon, you can ask her. Bitsy left the grocery store and made the rounds of several more establishments, but no one besides the owner of the dry cleaners had seen Monica the day before. I'm sure it was her, the dry cleaner said, handing Bitsy's phone back to her. I don't normally have that great of a memory, but I remember her because she was standing right outside the door when I went to open up. Scared me half to death. What time would that have been? I open up at nine. That matched with Dale's story. It wasn't quite noon yet, so Bitsy decided to kill some time at the library, which was just around the corner from the grocery store. Bitsy asked the librarian behind the checkout desk if she recognized Monica. Know her by name, said the librarian. She's in all the time. I heard yesterday she'd gone missing. Her husband came in this morning, asking us to put up a missing person flyer. Can I see it? Bitsy asked. She scanned the flyer. Nothing jumped out at her as new information but sometimes a thing one thought inconsequential took on new and greater importance later. Could I make some copies of this? Bitsy asked. To take around where he hasn't been yet? Sure, said the librarian. 
When was the last time you remember seeing Monica? Bitsy asked. The day she went missing, said the librarian. She came in around 9.40 and dropped a few books off. What kind of books? Bitsy asked. I'm sorry, but I can't tell you that. Of course, she couldn't, thought Bitsy. The books one chooses should be private. It probably didn't matter, anyway. It was almost noon, so Bitsy hurried back to the grocery store. Sure enough, Ralph had been replaced by a woman matching Katie's description. There wasn't anyone waiting to check out, so Bitsy walked straight up to Katie's check stand. Are you Katie? It was a silly question, especially since the checker in question was wearing a name tag that said Catherine on it. Yeah. Can I help you find something? Oh, no, said Bitsy. It's more of a personal question. I heard you are friends with Monica McCall. I am, said Katie. I'm Bitsy George. I own Bitsy's Bake Shop, just down the street. I've been talking to Monica's husband, Dale, and I'm a bit worried because after Monica came by to pick up some cupcakes from us yesterday, she seems to have disappeared. Yeah, I heard that, too. But I have no idea where she might have gone. I heard you were one of the last people to see her on the day she disappeared. Yeah, said Katie, I ran into her at the drugstore. Did she seem upset at all? Like she'd had a fight with her husband or something like that? Nah, said Katie. She didn't even mention Dale. Do you mind telling me what you did talk about? She was upset about something that's going on with her mother, said Katie. Oh, did they have a fight? No. Well, yes. Monica and her mother did have sort of a fight recently, but her mother isn't really the one Monica is angry with. Who is Monica upset with? There are these people Monica thinks are scamming her mother. Monica thinks they're running some sort of pyramid scheme, preying on retirees. Did she tell you who these people are? Bitsy asked. Don't know, said Katie. I think the person who got Gwen into the whole thing is local, but the scheme is much bigger than that. Monica says lots of people get recruited to it online. Who's the local person? Bitsy asked. All I know is she's a dentist, but I don't think Monica's really mad at her either, just frustrated someone smart enough to become a dentist would be so stupid as to fall for something that's so obviously a scam and then rope her mother into it, too. Chapter 3 Bitsy didn't get to work until nearly noon, and even when she did, she still got very little done in the way of baking. Instead, she went into the office and shut the door. There was someone she very much wished to have a talk with. That person was Jane Barton. Monica's friend Katie was convinced the local person involved in the possible scam was a female dentist. There were only two dentists in the town of Little Creek, and only one of them was a woman. It had to be Dr. Barton Katie had been talking about. Bitsy dialed the number for Jane Barton's office. I was wondering if you could have Dr. Barton call me, she told the receptionist. It's not about my teeth, it's personal. Uh, okay, said the receptionist. I'll have her call you back. It was the middle of the afternoon before Jane Barton called Bitsy back, and when she did, she seemed a little annoyed, but her annoyance abruptly dissipated when Bitsy informed her she'd heard Dr. Barton had recently invested in a new business opportunity, and she was interested in hearing more about it. Jane Barton agreed to meet with Bitsy at the bakery after she finished with her last patient. By the time Bitsy hung up, Jane was transparently excited. I'm so happy, Dr. Barton said just before ringing off. I'm finally finding people who know a gem of an opportunity when they see it. You wouldn't believe how resistive some people are to truly innovative and fresh ideas. Bitsy hung up in bewilderment. Was Jane Barton in on the scam or just an unwitting dupe? Or maybe, it wasn't a scam at all. Maybe, Monica McCall was just an overprotective daughter. Bitsy didn't hold out much hope her investigation of whatever money-making scheme Monica's mother had gotten herself entangled in would yield clues to Monica's whereabouts, but one had to follow up every lead, and, right now, that was the only lead Bitsy had. They showed that security camera footage of the scissor creep on the Fayetteville News last night 
said Annabel as Bitsy emerged from the office. Did you see it? Bitsy had, but she hadn't recognized the man in the images. The security camera footage was dark and grainy, and the man had kept his head down, obscuring his face. He looked awfully small, said Bitsy. He's either a very short and skinny man, or he's still a teenager. It's no wonder every woman he's attacked has managed to fight him off, albeit most of them have lost a little hair in the process. Bitsy hoped it wasn't just a matter of time before the attacker grew tired of the thrill of getting away with a lock of hair and moved on to more violent attacks. So far, he'd seemed content to take off after he whacked off a piece of hair. The only injuries to the women he'd attacked, all of which had been minor, seemed to have been inadvertent ones. It occurred to me he might be a teenager, too, said Annabel. Although, I've always thought of creepy middle-aged men being more the type to do something like that. The afternoon dragged on. Bitsy thought four o'clock would never come around. She was dreading her interview with Jane Barton and equally dreading her dinner date with Nick and his mother. Nick seemed oblivious to her anxieties. Looking forward to dinner tonight, he asked cheerfully as he came through the kitchen. Bitsy paused in her task of inserting the filling into a batch of strawberry caramel cupcakes. Sure, she replied, but she didn't mean it. I've never eaten Russian food, Nick added. It's always a pleasure to try a new cuisine. Bitsy agreed with him, but she doubted she'd be in any state to enjoy her food that evening. She still hadn't decided what to wear. She wanted to look her best without looking like she'd put too much effort into it. You all right? Nick asked. Of course. Why? It's just that you've been filling those strawberry cupcakes with raspberry filling instead of caramel cream. Oh, dear. Bitsy looked down at the pastry bag in her hand. Nick was right, that was what she'd been doing. Jane Barton arrived at 4.15, all smiles. I can't tell you how excited I am, she said, looking positively giddy. You're not going to regret this. The conversation we're about to have is going to change your life. Bitsy very much doubted that, but the whole point of meeting with Jane Barton was to hear the scheme for herself so she could make her own judgment, so Bitsy just smiled and nodded and mumbled something about how she was excited too. This is absolutely delicious, said Jane, holding up what was left of one of the strawberry caramel cupcakes off the plate Bitsy had placed on the table. It's a new flavor, very popular at the moment, Bitsy said. She looked up at the clock on the wall. She didn't have much time, not if she was going to get home and try to make herself presentable, before Nick came to pick her up after he closed at six. She'd better get straight to the point. Tell me more about this new business venture of yours, she prompted Jane. I'm not very good at explaining how it works. It's pretty complicated, Dr. Barton said, so I brought some brochures. She laid out a trio of glossy brochures on the table. Bitsy picked up one with a stock photograph of a woman in a red suit holding a phone to her ear and looking very businesslike. There has never been a better time to start your journey to wealth and prosperity. Earn up to $375,894 in just 32 weeks with a one-time purchase. Sit back, relax, and let our guaranteed and proven wealth-producing system do all the work for you. That's a lot of exclamation points, Bitsy thought. It was also odd that any business should predict its maximum profit potential in any given period down to the exact dollar. She tried not to let her skepticism show and kept on reading. Seem too good to be true? Keep reading and find out why InstaWealth 365 is the fastest-growing wealth-building program on the internet. Don't get left behind by the technology revolution. What is this program selling? Bitsy asked Jane. Selling? There's no selling, said Jane. That's the beauty of it. You just buy in once and let the system do all the work for you. So, there's no product? Product? You know, like skin care or nutritional supplements or something customers pay for. Oh, no, Jane insisted. There's nothing like that. This is strictly an investment opportunity. Bitsy suppressed a sigh and kept on reading. 
InstaWealth 365 is a patent-pending game-changing, paradigm-shifting wealth-building system that lets you make a one-time purchase of just $1,003 for your web optimization package, then auto-purchase additional packages out of your profits, which will give you a recurring bi-weekly income that adds up to $375,894 in just 32 weeks. What's a web optimization package? Bitsy asked. You get your own optimized website. Jane said, holding out her tablet to Bitsy. Here, look at mine. Jane's website featured a large InstaWealth 365 logo and a stock image of two generic businesspersons high-fiving each other. It also featured text which read identically to the brochure. How many of these web optimization packages have you purchased out of your profits? Bitsy asked. I'm up to 58 sites, said Jane proudly. I've chosen to reinvest all my profits. If I were to sell out now, I'd walk away with almost $60,000 in cash, but I'm holding tight. I might sell out when I hit $300,000. That would be enough to pay off my practice. Isn't it wonderful how technology has revolutionized wealth building? But how do all these websites actually make any money? Bitsy asked. I'm confused. There's no actual product or service. What are these websites providing? They are providing a phenomenal investment opportunity. Why does there have to be a product? Jane demanded. A legitimate business provides either a service or a product. A legitimate investment like a stock buys an ownership share in a business that provides either a service or a product. Sometimes, a legitimate investment will hold something of value, like gold or real estate, for example, on the assumption that it will increase in value and can be resold for more than the original purchase price. Jane just stared back at Bitsy with a look of confusion mixed with animosity on her face. These gazillion identical websites aren't selling anything except more web optimization packages, Bitsy continued, and, as far as I can see, have no value in and of themselves. To me, this looks an awful lot like a pyramid scheme. The only money coming in is from new recruits who aren't actually buying anything either, except theoretical ownership of a bunch of one-page copy and paste websites. This is not a pyramid scheme. Jane was livid now. It's a matrix. Big difference. She pulled out a piece of paper that contained a complicated table. See. Jane said, jabbing her finger angrily at the paper. I started out at level 25A because I bought six web optimization packages right from the get-go. I'm now on level 65F, which means my initial investment has doubled eight times. The math didn't even add up, but Bitsy wasn't going to go there. She should stop talking, she knew that. Jane wasn't trying to scam her, of that, Bitsy was certain. Jane was the one who'd been scammed. Jane Barton, D.D.S., who should have been smart enough to see through the scheme, had given some faceless lowlifes operating from who knows where in the bowels of cyberspace a substantial chunk of her hard-earned cash. Monica's mother had apparently done the same. It was no wonder Monica had been so angry. Bitsy couldn't resist making one last effort to get Jane Barton to see reason. Listen, she said to Jane. I know you are feeling very defensive, but I have to say I think you are a well-meaning person who's been taken to the tune of $6,000. You may think this is on the up and up, but somewhere out there, some deeply dishonest people who you'll never even meet are. Oh, but I have met them, said Jane. Her face was a deep shade of red. Clearly, Bitsy's attempt to warn her was not having its intended effect. You've met them? Bitsy was shocked. Yes. I have. Two of the nicest people you'll ever meet. Olga Schmidt and Jason Jameson. Olga happens to live right here in Little Creek. Jason is local, too. They are two of the most inspirational people I've ever had the pleasure of knowing. They aren't even in it for the money. They just want to help people. How? We met by divine appointment. I firmly believe that. Jane said. Jason Jameson's mother just happens to be one of my patients. She stood up and snatched away the brochures that lay on the table. 
Meeting those two was the best thing that ever happened to me, and it's people like you, Jane pointed an accusing finger at Bitsy. It's people just like you who they warned me about. I'm leaving before you drag me down to your level. I, unlike you, don't have such a limiting mindset. Bitsy didn't realize that she was shaking until Jane had departed. Sooner or later, Jane would come to see the wisdom of her advice, but it could be months from now, before the whole thing started to crumble. If Olga and Jason could convince people to keep sinking money into the scheme and then subsequently inspire them to reinvest their earnings, their hapless investors were unlikely to see these two for the hucksters they undoubtedly were. She'd consult Stan and see if he thought there was anything the local police could do to shut Instawealth 365 down, but, in the meantime, she'd investigate Olga Schmidt and Jason Jameson herself. Now, though, she had Nick's mother to meet. Bitsy looked at her watch. She had exactly 47 minutes until Nick was due to pick her up at home. Bitsy somehow managed to feed her cat Max his nightly ration of svelte kitty kibble, find something to wear and put on just enough makeup to look respectable and not so much Nick's mother could possibly find fault with her for trying to look too youthful. She really wasn't being fair to Nick's mother. She was already trying to anticipate all the ways Sybil Conrad might be critical of her son's choice of partner, and she hadn't even yet met the woman. In the end, Bitsy settled for a fluffy teal blue sweater, a nice pair of jeans, and high-heeled boots. She was a little dressed up, but not too much. Bitsy was smiling at herself in the mirror when her doorbell rang. You look great, said Nick as he held her at arm's length after he'd kissed her. Mom will probably be waiting for us at the restaurant by the time we get there, so we'd better get a move on. Didn't you tell her we'd meet her at 7.15? Oh, I told her. But she likes to be ridiculously early everywhere she goes. Great. Bitsy was late everywhere she went, as if she needed another reason for Nick's mother not to like her. On the way to the restaurant, Bitsy called Stan and told him what she'd found out about Monica being upset about her mother investing in a scam and that she'd already managed to identify the scammers. I intend to look into it more closely tomorrow, Bitsy told Stan. You be careful, Bitsy, said Stan. I know it's no good telling you not to go snooping around, but... I promise I'll be careful. I need to talk to you about something. Can we meet somewhere for breakfast tomorrow? Sure, how about Bub's Grill at 9? Chapter 4 I think I'll have the pelmeni, said Nick, as he set his menu back on the table. I can't believe we haven't come here before. Bitsy looked around the dimly lit restaurant, which occupied the ground floor of an old Victorian-era brick building in Fayetteville's old downtown. It was very tastefully done, with white tablecloths and suspended blown glass light fixtures that gave off just enough light to make one look one's best. It would have been a romantic atmosphere if it hadn't been for Sybil Conrad, the mother of the man she loved, sitting across the table from her. I don't know about you, Nick, said Sybil, but I think I'm speaking for the entire older generation when I say that I like to see what I'm eating. Am I right, Bitsy? Older generation. Bitsy wanted to scream, but she just fake laughed and said she thought the Olivier salad looked good and she'd always wanted to try one. Then a pretty blonde waitress named Katia came to take their order, and Bitsy didn't have to say anything more. As they waited for their food to come, Nick and Sybil kept up a back and forth about Nick's Aunt Cynthia's cancer diagnosis. Bitsy felt for the poor aunt, but she was grateful not to be the focus of the conversation. Then, abruptly, just as their dishes arrived, Sybil changed the subject. I hear a woman went missing in Little Creek a couple of days ago, said Sybil as she pronged a forkful of veal orloff. Yes, said Nick. Annabel was the last person to see her when she came in to pick up some cupcakes. Annabel? Sybil inquired. The morning baker, said Nick. You've met her a couple of times. Long brown hair. Oh, yes, said Sybil. Beautiful girl. Surprised you never asked her out. The two of you would have beautiful babies. Bitsy, who had been nervously draining her water glass, was caught mid-gulp and almost choked, but Nick appeared unfazed, 
as if it was perfectly normal for his mother to talk about him having babies with another woman right in front of his current love interest. Mom likes to tease me, said Nick, turning to Bitsy. She keeps bugging me for a grandchild, and I keep telling her. I guess I'm going to have to resign myself to the fact that I can't have everything I want, said Sybil. Of course, where there's life, there's hope. I knew a man once who fathered a child when he was in his seventies. Of course, with us women, it's a completely different situation. Right, Bitsy? Bitsy just gave Sybil a tight little smile and concentrated intensely on her salad, which was probably wonderful, but which she was no longer in the frame of mind to appreciate. Of course, Sybil continued. I understand you already have a daughter. Bitsy nodded. I do think it's so brave of women, these days, getting involved in a relationship again after being left for another woman, especially after being left for a much younger model. Nick must have talked to his mother about her divorce from Robert. Bitsy couldn't help wondering what the circumstances of Sybil's own divorce from Nick's father had been. Bitsy had never asked. She made a mental note to find out at the first opportunity. I guess it's something we women just have to live with, Sybil went on. The sad fact is we don't age as well as men, now do we? I've concluded, sooner or later, the best of men develops a wandering eye. Do they? Do they? Bitsy wanted to shout. Plenty of them didn't. Her brother Stan hadn't, and she bet Nick wouldn't either. If Nick preferred younger women, he would be dating one. Instead, he was dating her. Nobody had forced him to go out with her. If you'll excuse me, Bitsy said, standing to her feet. I have to use the ladies' room. As she returned from using the ladies, Bitsy passed by a table where two women, a redhead in her forties and a gray-haired woman in her seventies, were seated. Bitsy guessed they were mother and daughter. She paused when she heard the name Olga mentioned. The two women were so engrossed in their conversation that they were oblivious to Bitsy's presence. You know she's having an affair, said the older woman. No, replied the redhead. She is, with that so-called business partner of hers. You don't mean Jason? I do. I heard it from Kathy, who heard it from Irene, who heard it from Doris. Not exactly from the horse's mouth, thought Bitsy. It probably wasn't the same Olga and Jason who were involved in InstaWealth 365, anyway. Bitsy started to move on before the women noticed her eavesdropping, but she stopped in her tracks when the older woman said, no, they've been carrying on for years. According to Doris, that poor sweet husband of hers doesn't have a clue. Just then, the waitress came up to the women's table and asked them if they'd like to see the dessert menu, so Bitsy moved on. She just had to make it through another half an hour, and then she and Nick could leave unless someone ordered dessert. Normally, Bitsy was all about dessert, but tonight all she wanted to do was go home, take her heels off and try to forget the whole evening had ever happened. You want to split an order of Kissel? Nick asked as Bitsy sat down. No, thanks, I'm full. What about chocolate mousse? Nick suggested. I know you can't resist chocolate mousse. Bitsy shook her head. I really don't want any dessert. On a diet? asked Sybil. No, said Bitsy. Bitsy doesn't diet, said Nick. That's one of the things I like about her. I can take her places, and she actually eats. It was an obvious reference to Nick's thinness-obsessed ex-wife, Tracy, but it was the last subject Bitsy wanted to get into. She was curious about how Tracy and Nick's mother had gotten along. I'm pretty full, said Bitsy, but I'll have a couple of bites. Moment on the lips. Lifetime on the hips, said Sybil and laughed as if she'd said something terribly clever. I don't think your mother likes me very much, said Bitsy when they were finally out of the restaurant and safely into Nick's car. What do you mean, said Nick. What gave you that impression? Bitsy didn't know where to begin, so she just said, I got the distinct feeling she'd rather you were dating someone considerably younger and thinner. What makes you think that? All that stuff she said about aging, for example, and about wanting grandchildren. Oh, that, Nick laughed. 
She was just teasing me. She loved you. Sybil did not love her. Sybil did not even like her. If Bitsy hadn't been dating Nick, Sybil might have found Bitsy to be a perfectly lovely human being, but clearly, Sybil didn't think Bitsy was half good enough for her son. Did your mother like Tracy? Bitsy asked. Mom loved Tracy, said Nick. My mother has loved every woman I've ever. Are you sure? I don't know what you're getting at, said Nick. Bitsy could tell he was starting to get peeved. I've never seen you like this. Seen me like what? Bitsy was feeling a little peeved herself. How could he be so oblivious to the obvious digs his mother had taken at her? Now that she thought about it, practically everything Sybil had said to her the entire evening qualified as a dig. I've never seen you so insecure and oversensitive. Oversensitive? Oversensitive? Bitsy had a sinking feeling that she and Nick were on the brink of their first fight, which would doubtless make Sybil very happy, but Bitsy didn't feel like fighting. She turned to face the window and looked up at the cold night sky. It was a clear night, and the stars were so bright, they seemed close enough to reach out and touch. Did it really matter Nick's mother didn't like her? Did it really matter Nick couldn't see what his mother was really like? Bitsy decided it did not. At least not yet. Certainly not enough to force the issue on such a beautiful night. The next morning, Bitsy met her brother Stan and his wife Liz at Bub's Diner for breakfast. Stan was a semi-retired police officer who filled in from time to time at the Little Creek Police Department. Before their orders had even arrived, Bitsy had finished telling them all about her meeting with Jane Barton and her conviction that InstaWealth 365 was an outright scam. I'm sure you are right about it being a scam, said Stan. But that sort of thing isn't really a matter for local law enforcement, no matter how criminal it appears. I mean, if someone were out there trying to sell fake diamonds in the grocery store parking lot, we could arrest them, but for something like this. What can I do, then? You can file a complaint with the Better Business Bureau and the Federal Trade Commission, but as far as the courts go, it would be difficult to get anywhere unless you were an actual victim of the scam. I'm sure there is no shortage of victims, Bitsy pointed out. I'm sure you're right. But finding a victim who believes he is a victim and is willing to go to court to recover his money could prove to be quite a challenge. You really think so? Stan's right, said Liz. It's human nature. No one ever wants to admit to themselves they've been incredibly stupid and should have known better. People rationalize why schemes like this fail. I knew of one situation similar to this one where quite a number of victims lost all their money and then blamed it on the handful of participants who figured out early on they'd been had and sued to get their investment back. Really? Really? Oh, well. Bitsy sighed. You're sure there's nothing we can do? Why are you so interested in involving yourself? Stan asked. First of all, it just plain makes me mad to see people getting swindled, and, second of all, taking down InstaWealth 365 may have been what Monica McCall was in the process of trying to do when she disappeared. I didn't know that, said Stan. I wonder if anyone has talked to her husband about what he knows about Monica's connection to InstaWealth 365. I was wondering that, too, said Bitsy. And I plan to go straight to the source. Getting Dale to talk was easy. He agreed to meet Bitsy at the bakery during their mid-afternoon lull. How did you find out Monica's mother was involved in that scam, he asked. I just asked around, said Bitsy. You still haven't heard from Monica? No, said Dale. I'm worried sick. They haven't found her car or anything. I'm sure you must be terribly worried, said Bitsy. She didn't want to ask the next question, but she needed to know. Is there any chance Monica might have decided to leave you? You mean like for another man? Yes. Absolutely not. Dale turned red in the face, and his fingers involuntarily clenched into fists. Bitsy decided to change the subject. Monica's mother had invested in InstaWealth 365. How did Monica get involved? Well, I mean, it's obvious it's a scam, said Dale. 
You said yourself, you saw that right away. It was obvious to me, but not, I take it, so obvious, to Monica's mother? No. Gwen is still convinced Monica is just being controlling and paranoid. Gwen is certain if she just keeps rolling her profits back into InstaWealth 365, she'll end up a millionaire. So, nothing Monica said could shake her faith in InstaWealth 365? No. Gwen even meets regularly with the two who put the scheme together. They have in-person meetings occasionally for their really big spenders. I'm surprised. Aren't they running a risk someone will come to the meetings and question their methods? Maybe, but they minimize the risk by making those meetings invitation only, and they only invite their most loyal and unquestioning investors. Do you know how much money Gwen has put into the scheme? She stopped telling us anything she was doing when Monica started asking too many questions, but I know it's at least $100,000, because that's how much she inherited from an uncle of hers who died last year. Early on, she told Monica she'd put that whole inheritance into InstaWealth 365. You mean she put $100,000 of her own cash into the scheme? Are you sure that's not just what she believes her account is currently worth? No. Gwen put the whole $100,000 into InstaWealth 365, said Dale. Makes you sick, doesn't it? It does, rather. So, what steps had Monica taken to combat the scheme? She confronted the two who are running it, and threatened them, basically. Threatened them with what? Well, she'd figured out going through the legal system would be a ridiculously long process and probably destined to fail, anyway. That matched up with the advice Stan had given Bitsy. So, what did she do? Bitsy asked. Monica got some dirt on them. She wouldn't tell me how she found out the things she knew about those two. The whole thing has been terribly awkward for me. Olga, one of the partners in the scheme, is married to the other contractor I work with, Gregory. Gregory is an old friend of mine, and we've been in business together for years. I've never liked Olga, and neither has Monica, but up until Gwen got involved in that scammy investment scheme, everyone maintained a polite distance from one another. How in the world did Monica manage to find out sufficiently incriminating information to threaten them with? Bitsy asked. I'm not sure, said Dale. She refused to tell me. But what was she threatening to reveal about them? Monica got a hold of documents showing Jason hasn't been paying income taxes for years. According to Monica, Jason is on the verge of bankruptcy, but his wife didn't know it or that he hadn't been paying any income tax for years. Jason's wife? Hannah. They had twin boys. Six-year-olds, I think. Hannah stays home with them, last I knew. Monica also suspects Jason may have borrowed a lot of money from Olga to keep his illusion of wealth afloat. Jason and Hannah have an enormous, fancy house over in Fayetteville and a farm just north of Little Creek. They hardly ever go out to the farm. I think Hannah inherited it from her grandparents a few years back and had the idea they'd move out there and turn it into a working farm, but Jason wasn't interested. He's more of the flashy type not cut out to be a farmer. Although, I hear he grew up on a farm in Iowa, oddly enough, so he knows how to run farm equipment. You're sure this is accurate information Monica dug up? Bitsy asked. No, but Monica wasn't one to lightly spread gossip. She believed it was all true, and she insisted she had paperwork to back up some of her claims, although I suspect she may have committed mail fraud to get a hold of it. What about Olga? Why did you and Monica never warm up to her? Gregory married her almost twenty years ago. He met her in Germany when he was stationed there at an army base. I didn't like her right from the start. She's one of those people who can be charming when she wants to be, but there's no genuine warmth there. No ability to connect or empathize with other people. You know what I mean? Bitsy did. There was a name for that kind of person, sociopath. Olga can be downright cruel when she gets upset about something, Dale continued. They have three kids, and there's rarely any trouble with the younger two. But Olga and their oldest son, Seth, 
have constantly butted heads ever since he was just a little tyke. Gregory told me not too long ago that Olga got so angry with Seth that she told her son he was really the child of another woman from one of Gregory's previous relationships, and she'd adopted him when he was a baby, but now she regretted it. Told him his real mother was living right there in Little Creek, but he'd never know who she was because Gregory refused to divulge the identity of Seth's birth mother. Would it even be possible to hide something like that in a small community? I know confidentiality laws might hide a birth mother's identity, but there'd certainly be a record of the adoption. A lot of things sound credible to a 15-year-old that might be questioned by a person with more life experience. Seth's just a kid, and his mother is very persuasive. You're certain Seth isn't adopted? Bitsy asked. Absolutely sure of it. I was around during her entire pregnancy. Gregory told Seth over and over that Olga was lying to him, but since that's what Olga had warned Seth his father would say, Seth continues to believe his mother's hideous lie. What kind of person would say something like that to a kid? No decent human being tells a child he wasn't wanted. I can see why you don't like her, Bitsy said. Gregory knows his wife's not a very nice person, said Dale, but he doesn't seem to realize quite how bad she is. For one thing, I don't think he understands InstaWealth 365 is nothing more than a glorified Ponzi scheme. Gregory and I went into business together with the understanding Olga would never have a say in anything we did, and I think Gregory doesn't involve himself in her business affairs either. She's done very well for herself, I must say, even if quite a bit of it may be ill-gotten gains. They live a rather extravagant lifestyle, or at least Olga does. Gregory would be content with a considerably simpler way of living. What about Olga's business partner, Jason? How do you feel about him? He's all right. A bit slick. He was very much the wheeler dealer type, so he and I never really hit it off. Gregory's never said anything really negative about him, but then the two of them rarely spend time together. But Olga and Jason do? Bitsy watched Dale's face carefully as she asked the question. Had he heard rumors about an affair between Olga and Jason? His expression told her he had not. I suppose they must, Dale said, since they work together. Dale paused before he went on as if he had something else he wanted to say but hadn't decided whether he should share it. I have a feeling, he finally admitted, there was something else Monica knew about Olga or Jason she wasn't telling me. I just don't know why. Any idea what it might be? Bitsy was pretty sure she knew what it might be. If Monica had dug up evidence Jason hadn't been filing his income tax, she'd surely come across the much more accessible rumor that Olga and Jason were having an affair. Probably, she hadn't wanted Dale to have to be the one to have to break it to Gregory that his wife was cheating on him. Or perhaps, Monica had intended to use the information as leverage to get Olga and Jason to shut down their fraudulent scheme, or at least give Gwen her money back. I have no idea what she might have been keeping from me, Dale continued. And I might be wrong. It's just a gut feeling. Have you told any of what you've told me to the police? Bitsy asked Dale. No, Dale replied. I'm pretty sure Monica used all manner of shady tactics to get a hold of that information. But what if they'd done something to her? Bitsy stopped when she saw Dale's face. I refuse to even entertain the idea that Olga or Jason might have been involved in Monica's disappearance, Dale said. I can't fathom that anyone, even someone as heartless as Olga, would do any serious harm to the wife of her husband's best friend and business partner. Bitsy was far from convinced Olga was incapable of doing anyone any serious harm. She seemed to have no conscience when it came to defrauding the gullible or inflicting psychic pain on her own offspring. Still, it was quite a leap from fraud and emotional abuse to kidnapping and, possibly, murder. Monica could be anywhere. She might not even still be alive. There was another troubling possibility. Sure, it seemed certain Monica had been upset about her mother's involvement with InstaWealth 365, but everything else Dale had told Bitsy would be nearly impossible to verify. What if everything Dale was telling her was some elaborate lie to throw Bitsy off the scent? 
The most troubling possibility of all was that Dale himself was behind Monica's disappearance. Sadly, when it came to murdered wives, the husband was the natural suspect. Is there anything I can do to help? Bitsy asked Dale. I might be able to pose as an interested investor and find out something more about Olga and Jason. I don't really think either of them has anything to do with it, said Dale. But I suppose it's worth looking into. Right now, the police seem a lot more interested in me than they do in finding any other leads. You think you're a suspect? Yeah, said Dale. I mean, I'm the husband, aren't I? If I'm not their prime suspect already, it's only a matter of time before fingers start pointing in my direction. I believe you had nothing to do with whatever happened to Monica, said Bitsy. It was true. Her heart did believe him, but her brain wasn't so sure she should. I don't know what to do, said Dale. I feel so helpless. How would you feel about confronting Olga and Jason? Bitsy asked. Well, not so much confronting as paying them a visit and gauging their reaction? What would that accomplish? I mean, if InstaWealth 365 is involved somehow, wouldn't confronting Olga or Jason put Monica in even greater danger? Bitsy was silent. Monica was likely already dead. Dale, even though she hated to entertain the possibility, might have murdered his wife. However, if Dale was as innocent as she hoped, then those involved in InstaWealth 365 were the only other suspects on Bitsy's list if she didn't count that creepy scissors guy. All right, forget confronting them yourself. What about getting me into one of their meetings? Bitsy asked. Do you think you could get Gwen to let me go along? Not likely, said Dale. I've never been Gwen's flavor of the month, and now I'm her prime suspect. What about trying to find out if anyone has seen Monica's car since she's disappeared? Bitsy asked. Do you happen to have a picture of it? I could make up another flyer and take it around for you. I think I have one somewhere, Dale said. I'll send it to you with the license plate number. So, how did meeting Nick's mother go? Bitsy's sister-in-law, Liz, asked. Liz looked around the bakery kitchen. You know I miss this place, sometimes. It's a little weird being retired. I get up in the morning and don't have to be anywhere. I kind of miss having somewhere to go every day. It was almost closing time. Bitsy was working on making fillings for tomorrow's batch of raspberry ripple cupcakes, so it would be ready for Hector and Annabel when they came in to do the early morning bake. You want to start coming in part-time? Bitsy asked. We can always use more help. Well, I wouldn't go that far, said Liz. But if you ever need me to fill in for somebody, of course. What about tomorrow, said Bitsy. Could you fill in for me then? Hot date? Hardly. Bitsy planned on skulking around and seeing what she could find out about Olga Schmidt and Jason Jameson, but she wasn't sure about telling Liz. Stan, not to mention Nick, would go through the roof and forbid her to get involved if they found out. But it was too late to stay out of it now, she was already involved. Fine, said Liz. Don't tell me. I'm sure it has something to do with Monica McCall's disappearance, and you don't want to tell me because I'll tell Stan, but for goodness sake, you better tell somebody. Okay, okay, said Bitsy. You never did tell me how it went with Nick's mother? Liz persisted. It was a fiasco, said Bitsy. She can't stand me, but Nick doesn't see it that way. That doesn't surprise me, said Liz. What did she say to you? Well, there were quite a few jabs about my age and being past childbearing years, and at one point, she had the audacity to suggest Nick and Annabel would make beautiful babies. Wow, said Liz. And Nick didn't seem to think that was inappropriate? No. He didn't, Bitsy said flatly and changed the subject. I'm going to try and get into one of the InstaWealth 365 meetings. Monica's husband Dale is convinced the InstaWealth 365 hucksters have nothing to do with Monica's disappearance, but I'm not. He didn't have any suggestions about how to go about getting into one of their meetings. He and Monica's mother, Gwen, are barely on speaking terms. 
Apparently, Gwen doesn't trust Dale, thinks he's responsible for Monica going missing. Are you sure you trust him? Liz asked. I imagine there are lots of people down at the police department who'd be willing to bet good money he had something to do with Monica's disappearance. I don't think he's lying to me, said Bitsy. Before she left the shop for the evening, Bitsy made up another missing person flyer using the photo and license plate number Dale had texted her earlier in the evening. She decided it was too late to take them around to area businesses. Since it was after six, most of the shops downtown would be closed. That task would have to wait for tomorrow. The next morning, since Liz was taking over her midday shift at the bake shop, Bitsy spent some time doing a bit of online sleuthing while she ate her breakfast. First, she looked up the addresses of Olga Schmidt's house in Little Creek. She entered the address in her search bar and came up with an old real estate listing. Dale had not been exaggerating about the ostentation of the house. Even unfurnished, the place screamed, I'm rich, and I want everyone to know it. Who has genuine gold-plated faucets? Bitsy asked Max, who lolled in a patch of sun at her feet. Do you think Faux Chateau is truly tasteful? Max did not venture an opinion. Bitsy absently reached down to stroke his fur, and he began purring. Bitsy noted the address of Olga and Gregory Schmidt's home and moved on to tracking down the Jamesons' residence and farm. Their house in Fayetteville was easy to locate, but Bitsy could find no pictures of the interior. From the outside street view, it looked spacious and expensive, but much less imposing than the home belonging to the Schmidts. Finding Hannah Jameson's family farm proved to be a challenge. All Bitsy knew was that it was located just outside of Little Creek. Bitsy decided to text Dale and ask him where the farm was located. She got an immediate response back. It was near the intersection of Culver Lane and Farm to Market Road, Dale said. He sent her the address. Before setting out to distribute the flyers and drive by the properties owned by the Schmitz and the Jamesons, Bitsy decided to spend a little more time on Monica's blog, going over her posts for the last several weeks to see if she could detect anything amiss. It was possible Monica might have been suffering from severe depression, she'd grown adept at hiding. That happens sometimes. People might be on the brink of a desperate act, yet able to conceal the extent of their disordered thinking from those who loved them the most. Monica's blog featured bubbly reviews of local eateries and her own enthusiastic renditions of recipes for various sweet treats. There was nothing in any of Monica's recent posts that raised any red flags. The only useful information Bitsy gleaned was that Monica was excited about an upcoming vacation to Mexico, which seemed to be a yearly tradition. It hardly seemed likely that a woman whose apparent greatest concern was that her sweet tooth might interfere with fitting into last year's swimsuit would be in a state of mind to take her own life. Bitsy noted that Monica had recently found out she was lactose intolerant and was experimenting with developing recipes for dairy-free baked goods but that hardly seemed to be useful information. Bitsy stared at the photograph of Monica's smiling face, surrounded by a halo of blonde curls. Why would someone like Monica suddenly vanish? Bitsy asked Max, but Max had fallen asleep again. Bitsy decided she'd distribute the flyer's first thing. As she made her rounds of the local businesses, she asked at each if anyone had seen anything suspicious the day Monica disappeared. Everyone was sympathetic and eager to help, but no one had any useful information until Bitsy came to Speedy Pete's filling station on the edge of town. There was no Speedy Pete. The man who owned the station's name was Fred. Fred took a long look at the flyer before he spoke. This here says that it had a cracked windshield since the picture was taken. Yes, said Bitsy. Monica's husband told me so and Monica was last spotted picking up some cupcakes at my bakery, and one of my employees told me the same thing. And it was really dirty? That's what my employee said. I think I might have seen it. Really? Where? Right near here. But it's gone now. That was a couple of days ago, Tuesday or Wednesday, maybe. I'm not sure, cause I didn't think nothing of it at the time but it was pulled off the side of Culver Road. It had a flat tire, and there was no one around, at least who I saw. 
What time of day was it? Late afternoon, early evening. I don't remember exactly. I was leaving here to go home, but I don't keep real regular hours, so I'm not sure exactly when I would have been passing by. Depends if I've got good help when I leave. What about the I break for cupcakes bumper sticker? Did you see that? Bitsy pointed to the flyer. The bumper sticker was a detail Dale had included when he'd sent the picture and the license plate number. I don't pay no attention to stuff like bumper stickers. Maybe there was one, but I didn't see it. When did you notice the car had disappeared off the side of the road? The next morning, when I came back to the station, probably around 10 in the morning. Are you sure you can't remember if it was Tuesday or Wednesday evening when you saw the car? Nope. My days all kinda run together. Bitsy thanked the man and went back out to her car. She texted Dale and asked him if Monica had mentioned having a flat tire on Culver Road earlier in the week. Dale texted back right away and said no. Is that the sort of thing Monica would tell you about? Yeah. She'd call me up and ask me to come get her. Then I think it's likely someone saw Monica's car after she disappeared. On Culver Road? Yeah. There was no further response from Dale. Bitsy decided he was having trouble processing that Monica's car had been seen near Jason and Hannah's farm. Dale seemed so determined not to entertain a serious notion that anyone associated with Instawealth 365 could be involved with Monica's disappearance. Bitsy went back into Speedy Pete's. Do you think you could show me exactly where you saw what might have been Monica's car? Bitsy asked Fred. Don't have no help here right now, so I can't leave the place, but I remember where I saw it, Fred said. If you go down Culver Road towards the old Marson place. I'm not familiar with the old Marson place. You can't miss it. Big red barn. Mailbox out front, made to look like a fire engine. Well, right before you get to the driveway, you'll see a big oak tree that fell across the pasture fence. Fell right into the ditch there. The highway department ended up cutting off some branches, cause it was blocking the road. The car was pulled off to the side, right there, by that big oak that fell down. Thanks very much, Bitsy said and turned to go. Oh, I remembered one more thing, said Fred, calling her back. The tire wasn't just flat, it had been driven right down to the rim till it wouldn't go no further. I don't know how anyone could not have known they had a flat, the thing must have been sparking like crazy. Bitsy drove down Culver Road. She watched the numbers on the mailboxes as she went. She was getting close to Hannah Jameson's old family farm. She came around a curve in the road and saw the big red barn and the fire engine mailbox, just as Fred had told her. Bitsy looked at the number on the mailbox. It matched the address Dale had given her. The old Marson place was Hannah and Jason Jameson's farm. Bitsy pulled off the side of the road a little way back from the fallen oak. She walked up to it, careful to stay on the pavement so as not to disturb any of the evidence she might find there. There were ruts off the side of the road consistent with a vehicle having been steered off the edge, and there was also another set of tracks as if a piece of construction equipment had hooked onto the disabled vehicle and hauled it away. Both sets of tracks came back onto the pavement, and for a few feet, dried mud showed the car, and whatever was hauling it had continued, but then the muddy tracks gave out. Bitsy dialed Stan's number and put the phone to her ear. What is it, Bitsy? I think someone may have spotted Monica's car the afternoon she disappeared. Where? Bitsy gave Stan the address. Tell your policeman friends they need to talk to Fred at Speedy Pete's. He's the one who saw the car. Where are you now? Standing on the side of the road. Well, get back in your car and go home, Stan ordered. I'm perfectly safe, Bitsy insisted. You're alone at a possible crime scene, Stan said. What's so safe about that? I don't think the fallen oak I'm looking at is going to suddenly rear up and attack me, Bitsy said, trying to make a joke. Stan was not amused. Don't go rooting around and get yourself in trouble, Stan said and hung up. Bitsy fumed a little and then got back down to business. 
After Stan's warning, she had to admit to herself she was a little nervous. She decided it was better to pull all the way into the driveway of the old Marson place. If she was challenged about what she was doing there, it would be much more believable to say she was looking for someone if she was parked in the driveway like a legitimate visitor. She'd be less conspicuous if she left her car parked where it was on the shoulder of the road, but it would also make her cover highly suspect if she was caught wandering around the place on foot like a thief casing the joint. Bitsy giggled at the thought of anyone mistaking her for the sort of thief who'd steal old farm equipment or whatever it was they kept in that big red barn. She more fit the profile of someone who'd be caught stealing donuts. She looked down at her expanding waistline. She needed to knock off the cupcakes and take up jogging, she admonished herself. Bitsy drove down the long driveway and parked next to an old battered pickup sitting in front of the small ramshackle farmhouse that sat apart from the barn. The pickup had weeds growing up around its flat and balding tires. The house was run down and shabby and, even when new, had never been much to look at. Clearly, the previous owners of the farm had prioritized agriculture over housing. Bitsy had yet to meet Jason Jameson in person, but based on everything she'd been told about him, she couldn't imagine him being caught dead living in a house like that. Bitsy shivered involuntarily. She was feeling increasingly nervous. She shouldn't have used the expression, caught dead in. She was in no mood to deal with dead bodies. In fact, she was never in the mood to deal with dead bodies. Certainly not solo. Determined to be as discreet as possible, just in case anyone should be about the place, Bitsy crossed the rickety porch and knocked on the door. The faded curtains were drawn shut. She knocked again. No answer. No sign of life within. Anybody home? She called out loudly. Bitsy decided to go out to the barn and make sure no one was there before she started poking around. At the barn, she called out again repeatedly, but no one answered. Now confident she was alone, Bitsy tried a small door on the side of the barn. It was locked. The larger barn door on the end was big enough to drive equipment or vehicles through. It had also been padlocked shut. There was no way in, so Bitsy walked the perimeter of the barn, looking for a window. She didn't find one until she came to the backside of the barn, and she almost missed it. Low to the ground, there was a small opening cut in the concrete foundation. Bitsy got down on her stomach on the cold, rocky ground and peered inside. Evidently, under at least part of the barn was an old dirt root cellar. It was now filled with a dusty jumble of broken tools and sacks of fertilizer. There was nothing of note about the room, except there was a low door on one wall, which apparently led to another room. Bitsy continued along the back of the barn another few feet until she came to another window. It must be the window into the second section of the cellar on the other side of the door, she thought. It was impossible to look through that window, however, because it was obscured by a large metal barrel. Empty, Bitsy might have been able to move the barrel out of the way, but it was full of water, so she gave up any chance of seeing what was inside the second room. As she was leaving the barn, she tripped over the large metal lid, which had originally sealed off the top of the barrel. Her foot still smarting from tripping over the barrel lid, Bitsy limped back to the house and made a circuit around it, as well, but all the windows were covered with faded curtains. The place looked to have been abandoned for years. Bitsy could have walked out to the pond in the pasture behind the barn, but her foot still hurt, and she gave the pond a miss. There were no other outbuildings on the place to search, and Bitsy was feeling increasingly nervous. The sky clouded over, and it started to sleet a little. Bitsy got back in her car, reversed out of the driveway, and put a good three miles between herself and the old Marson place before she pulled off to the side of the road and entered the address for Hannah and Jason Jameson's Fayetteville home into her car's navigation system. Chapter 6 Forty minutes later, Bitsy was in Fayetteville. It was past lunchtime, and she decided to stop for a hamburger before continuing her spying on the Jamesons. She had just received her order when she got a text from Dale. Monica left me. Left you? Bitsy texted back. She finally contacted me last night. She's left me for another man. Bitsy didn't know what to say. 
half of her wanted to reply, I'm so sorry, and the other half wanted to say, why should I believe that? She dialed Dale's number, hoping he'd pick up. He'd have a harder time ignoring her midway through a string of texts. Hi Bitsy, he said when he answered and immediately launched into an apology before Bitsy had a chance to say anything at all. He was sorry he'd wasted her time like this, he said. He'd lied to her about the state of his marriage, and he was sorry about that, too. He and his wife hadn't been happy for a long time, so he guessed he shouldn't be so shocked Monica had decided to end it. He was disappointed that Monica had decided to leave him, but that was her right, and he wasn't going to stand in her way. Dale spoke in a rush as if he'd memorized what he was going to say and wanted to get it all out before he forgot any of it. Dale was lying. Bitsy was 98% sure of it. Monica texted you last night? Bitsy asked. No, Dale answered, again rushing his words. She called. He'd anticipated that question. He'd figured out that if he said Monica had texted, an obvious possibility might be someone else was using her phone to send messages in the hopes of cutting short the search. But why would he do that? Why would he suddenly come up with this story? If he'd wanted to pass off his wife's disappearance as a voluntary choice on her part, why would he suddenly decide to do so days after she'd gone missing? Did she say where she'd gone to? Bitsy asked. No, she just said not to look for her. So, she intends to file for divorce? Yeah, seems like it. It seems a rather bizarre way of breaking up. I can't say it's not a bit of a shock, but at least it's a nice clean break. Liar. Bitsy wanted to shout. Instead, she just said she supposed it was and hung up. Bitsy took her burger to go, and as soon as she was back in her car, she called Stan and filled him in on the latest developments. Do you think he's told the police what he told me? She asked her brother. If he hasn't yet, I'm sure he's going to, said Stan. I doubt they're going to believe him, though. Will they be able to look through his phone? If they get a warrant, which shouldn't be too hard under the circumstances. It might not yield much concrete information, though. Wouldn't it show if the conversation between Dale and Monica took place? Even as she asked the question, she already knew the answer. If Dale was also in possession of Monica's phone, he could call himself or send himself texts purporting to be Monica. Just because his phone showed a call from Monica, there was no way of knowing if she'd been the one to place it. Never mind, Bitsy trailed off. Do you think they'll arrest him? They could, I suppose, said Stan. But without sufficient evidence, they'd just have to release him again. I expect they'll be taking him in for more questioning, though. Bitsy hurriedly finished her hamburger and headed off in the direction of the Jameson home. She never got there. The highway leading to the Jamesons was having roadwork done, and by this time, it was late afternoon, and traffic was heavy. Bitsy rerouted her navigation system to drive by the Schmidt's home in Little Creek's only upscale neighborhood instead. The Jameson house would have to wait for another day. She didn't have a clue what she was looking for. She should just do the sensible thing and go home. This was a job for the police. Nothing made sense except the possibility Dale McCall was not who Bitsy believed him to be and had done something terrible to his wife. The Schmidt home was every bit as garishly impressive as it had been in the real estate listing photos. It looked like a mafioso's conception of elegance. It was enormous, set back from the street, and surrounded by an eight-foot brass and wrought iron fence with a gate and a call box. Through the fence, Bitsy could see the pink concrete driveway leading up to the garish but nevertheless impressive front portico, which was supported by black marble columns, or at least what passed for black marble, from a distance. Bitsy decided she wasn't going to see much more. She felt slightly silly for being there. She was just about to pull away from her vantage point at the curb when the gate swung open, and a boy on a bicycle came riding out. He was a morose-looking boy of 14 or 15 dressed entirely in black and wearing a backpack. He did not even glance at Bitsy as he rode by her car. Was it Seth? He was the right age, and he certainly had the demeanor of a boy who did not believe his mother loved him. 
Bitsy felt her blood pressure rise. She had no way of knowing if Dale's story about Olga telling Seth he wasn't wanted was true, but true or not, it made Bitsy angry just thinking about it. Bitsy went home and, despite her vow earlier in the day to knock off the sweets, ate an entire bowl of chocolate ice cream in lieu of supper. The next morning Bitsy was restocking the bakery display case out front when Stan called. Bitsy's bake shop opened late on Sunday mornings, and, even so, there were hardly any customers yet. Later, there would be the after-church crowd, but for now, things were quiet. Bitsy propped the phone up against the cash register and put Stan on speaker, so she could have her hands free. When Stan told her Dale had gone missing, too, Bitsy almost dropped a whole tray of banana cream cupcakes. According to Stan, the police had been attempting since the day before to contact Dale by phone and had finally gone to his house, where they'd also gotten no response. I don't believe it, she said. It's true. No question about it. What now? she asked. What should I do now? Nothing. Absolutely nothing. It's a matter for the police now. When the husband of a missing woman disappears abruptly like that, it's ten to one he's murdered his wife and knows the police are closing in. I disagree, said Bitsy. There could be another explanation. What explanation? I don't know. Well, I don't think there is one, said Stan. When I said ten to one, that was an exaggeration. It's more like a thousand to one. I'm sorry to have to say it, but I really don't believe Monica McCall is still alive. Well, I'm holding out hope, said Bitsy. Oh, and another interesting bit of information, which will be on the news this evening minus names. Yes? They caught that scissor fiend? Oh. Yes, he attacked a woman on the walking trail at the park and tried to cut off her hair. A passerby intervened and wrestled him to the ground, then he held him there, till the police arrived. The scissor fiend didn't turn out to be Seth Schmidt, by any chance? Bitsy asked. How did you know that? Oh, I keep my eyes and ears open. I see things. I hear things. Well, mind you don't get yourself killed doing it. Stan hung up. Bitsy took an angry bite out of the last remaining banana cream cupcake on her tray. She was fifty years old. Stan would always be her big brother, but he had no right to boss her around. Telling her she shouldn't get herself killed was a gross exaggeration. She would go on with the investigation, and since the husband of the missing woman had disappeared, she would go with Monica's next closest connection. It was high time she had a talk with Monica's mother. Bitsy had to wait until mid-afternoon to do anything more in the way of tracking down Monica's mother, Gwen Sanderson, but as soon as Bitsy could get away, she headed down to the grocery store in hopes of finding Monica's friend Katie manning the checkout line. Luck was with her, and Katie seemed happy to help. Katie had already heard about Dale going missing. What Katie knew nothing about was Dale's claim that Monica had contacted him. I can't believe she'd just leave like that, said Katie. Although it's true they were having trouble with their marriage. Monica didn't talk about it much, but I could tell, just from little things she'd say. Katie had taken her break early, so she and Bitsy could talk in private, and they stood in the back alley behind the grocery store while Katie had a smoke. Do you think Dale was abusive? Bitsy asked. That was the only possible reason she could think of for an otherwise emotionally stable wife to suddenly take off without warning and then refuse to divulge her whereabouts. I don't think so, said Katie. She never hinted at anything like that. Katie came to the end of her cigarette, and she let the butt drop to the pavement and ground it out with her foot. Her break must be almost over. What do you think about me trying to talk to Gwen, see what she thinks? Bitsy asked. Gwen never liked Dale much, so I imagine she'll automatically assume the worst. But she might know something useful. She might, said Katie. If you really want to talk to her, I know where you can find her. According to Katie, every Sunday afternoon, Gwen went to the Shady Grove retirement home to visit an elderly aunt of hers. If Bitsy hurried, she just might run into Gwen. When Bitsy asked Katie what Gwen looked like, 
Katie laughed and said she'd have no trouble spotting her. She was tall, Katie said, almost six feet, with bright red hair and a laugh that could strip paint off walls. If she's there, said Katie, you'll probably hear her before you see her. She's the loudest person I've ever met. Seriously, you ought to take earplugs. Bitsy hurried over to Shady Grove. She'd been there many times before to visit Nick's grandfather, Roscoe, but she'd never encountered a six-foot red head with an abrasive laugh. As soon as she walked through the automatic sliding glass doors at the entrance of Shady Grove, Bitsy knew her mission would be a success. She heard a braying laugh and followed the sound into the common room. There, sitting on a couch underneath the windows, was a tiny woman of at least ninety, and next to her, a giant of a woman in her late fifties who sported an enormous teased halo of bright red hair. It had to be Gwen. Chapter 7 Gwen was carrying on a running conversation with herself with no assistance whatsoever from the tiny old woman sitting beside her. The ancient aunt was staring into space. Perhaps, she was one of those poor souls who had lost her faculties, or perhaps, she was just pretending for the moment to have lost them. People like Gwen needed no encouragement. Now that she'd found Gwen, Bitsy didn't know how to approach her. She wasn't sure the direct approach was the best approach with someone like Gwen. She needed an assistant. Bitsy ducked back out the door of the common room and texted Nick's grandfather, Roscoe. He lived just down the hall, but he wasn't exactly diligent about keeping track of his phone. Sometimes, he'd let the battery run down, and it would be off for days. Today, however, luck was with her. Thirty seconds after Bitsy sent the text, her phone rang. It was Roscoe. He didn't text. Bitsy hastily withdrew around the corner, so she could talk, not that she was terribly worried about Gwen overhearing. It would have been difficult to hear any conversation over the sound of Gwen's voice. It was odd that Gwen should be in such seemingly high spirits if she believed her daughter had recently been kidnapped and possibly murdered. Extremely odd. Bitsy explained, in very bare terms, why she was at Shady Grove and what Roscoe could do to help her. Then she hung up. Less than a minute later, Roscoe shuffled into the common room, took a seat near Gwen and her aunt, and pretended to read a three-day-old newspaper. Bitsy waited another minute or two and then strode into the room and headed straight for Roscoe. She gave him a big hug and loudly inquired about how his heart was doing. She was truly happy to see Roscoe. She didn't come to see him nearly often enough. He always lifted her spirits. Roscoe said his heart was doing just fine and then turned his attention to the two ladies seated on the couch. Betty, this must be your daughter. He directed the statement toward the tiny old woman. She immediately perked up. Roscoe had been forced to talk right over the top of Gwen to address Betty, but Gwen was unfazed. She went right on talking, something about what Letitia had said to Veronica and how she, Gwen, had replied. Something about a missing casserole dish, Bitsy gathered, and how there were certain people who hadn't done their part in the kitchen during the last bi-monthly community potluck supper. Bitsy didn't blame Betty for deciding that staring blankly into space was the best response to Gwen's monologue on Letitia Sumbodiorther's failure to get the coffee urn sufficiently clean. Betty shifted her body toward Roscoe and Bitsy and informed them that the woman on the couch beside her, who had now moved on to the subject of a punch bowl missing from the community center kitchen, was not her daughter. This is my sister's girl, said Betty in a tone that suggested she herself would never have given birth to such an offense to the airwaves. Betty patted Gwen's arm to gain her attention, but Gwen was far too engrossed in the drama surrounding the missing punch bowl to notice. Betty tried again, practically slapping her this time. Ouch, Gwen protested. Betty broke out into what could only be described as a grin. Sorry, my dear. I want you to meet a friend of mine. She pointed to Roscoe. This is Roscoe, and you must be, she broke off as she looked at Bitsy. This is my grandson's lady friend, Roscoe said. Oh, said Gwen. She looked ready to launch right back into her story of the missing crystal. Lovely to meet you, dear, said Betty, clearly hoping they would extract her from the clutches of Gwen. 
You look familiar, Bitsy said to Gwen. Gwen didn't look familiar. Bitsy was pretty sure she'd never seen her before in her life, but she had to start the conversation somewhere, and, given the circumstances, she could live with herself if she told a little white lie. We must have met somewhere before. I don't think so, said Gwen. Do you have a daughter? Bitsy asked. Yes. Gwen didn't look inclined to elaborate, but she also didn't look like someone worried sick about her daughter's welfare, either. That must be it, said Bitsy, feigning enthusiasm. You must be Monica's mother. I really don't remember meeting you. Gwen turned back to Betty. As I was saying, Veronica thinks Letitia broke. How is Monica? Bitsy interrupted. I haven't seen her for ages. She moved, Gwen replied. Moved? That was new. And weird. Oh, I didn't know that. Bitsy tried not to look ruffled. Where did she move to? I'd rather not say, said Gwen. Oh, said Bitsy and almost stopped, but now was not the time to be polite, so she persisted. Why can't you tell me? She's run away from her husband, Gwen said. He always was a no good. Betty cleared her throat loudly. I had no idea, said Bitsy. I thought they always seemed very happy together. Are you saying she actually told you to keep her whereabouts a secret? Another little white lie. At this rate, her nose was going to start growing, like Pinocchio's. Gwen leaned toward them and, in what she probably thought was a conspiratorial whisper, said, I thought that no good. Betty cleared her throat loudly again. I thought, Gwen persisted, that Dale, she stopped talking. You mean your daughter Monica is that woman who went missing a few days back? Roscoe asked, all innocence. I saw something about it in the papers. Gwen just nodded. I didn't see that article, said Bitsy, crossing her fingers behind her back. I had no idea. She really needed to stop lying, but she'd lied herself into a corner. But I thought she was still missing, said Roscoe. That's what I thought, too, said Gwen, up until yesterday. I thought Dale had taken her off somewhere and killed her or something. Gwen shuddered slightly, then brightened up. But then she called me yesterday and set my mind at ease. Bitsy was astonished. Maybe Dale had been telling the truth, but still, why had he disappeared? An awful possibility occurred to Bitsy. What if Dale had been so despondent about his wife leaving him that he had decided to take his own life? But if so, why had he been so unconvincing when he'd related his story of Monica calling to inform him that she'd left him for another man? That must have been a relief, said Bitsy. Don't tell anyone, said Gwen. Monica said to keep it a secret. Of course not, Bitsy reassured her. Naturally, if Dale was as bad as you say, she'd rather he didn't know where she is. I didn't mean that, said Gwen. Even I don't know where she is. No, she didn't want me to even let on she'd contacted me. So much for keeping it a secret, thought Bitsy. She believed Gwen was telling the truth, but why would Monica do anything so bizarre? Why would she first call her husband, tell him she was leaving him, and then call her mother and tell her the same thing, but then ask her mother to keep that conversation a secret from the very man with whom she'd just shared an almost identical version of events? Bitsy was very confused. Well, it's a relief to know she's okay, said Roscoe, looking equally befuddled. Gwen fidgeted in her seat as if she regretted having told them so much. Bitsy decided she'd gleaned all the information about Monica she was going to get, so she moved on to her second objective. I remember Monica telling me something about how you'd discovered this great new investment opportunity, Bitsy said. Oh? Gwen looked highly suspicious. I can't imagine her saying anything like that. I did stumble onto something phenomenal, but Monica checked it out and convinced herself it was some sort of scam. Really? said Bitsy. She didn't say anything like that to me. She must have mentioned it to me early on, before she changed her mind about it. Gwen looked a shade less skeptical, and Bitsy pressed the advantage. I can't imagine what she could have found wrong with it, Bitsy said. 
It sounded like a terrific opportunity to me. Bitsy tried to count the number of lies she'd told in the last ten minutes. Was it six or seven? She'd lost count. Are you still interested? Gwen asked, finally abandoning the saga of the community potluck supper and the missing punch bowl. I'd love to learn more about it, said Bitsy, putting as much enthusiasm into the declaration as she could muster. There. That was not a lie. She did sincerely want to learn all she could about InstaWealth 365, just not for the reasons Gwen was imagining. I could try to explain it to you myself, but it's kind of complicated, Gwen said. We have an investors meeting tonight. Why don't you come with me? It's an exclusive private meeting with the company founders, and it's just for the top producers, but I'm allowed to bring a vetted guest. Bitsy wondered what Gwen meant by vetted, but she wasn't going to spoil the illusion of enthusiasm by questioning anything. If Gwen could get her into one of those meetings, Bitsy was convinced she'd find out something, even if that something was evidence Dale had been intentionally misdirecting Bitsy's attention and neither founder of InstaWealth 365 could have had anything to do with Monica's disappearance. I'd love to go, said Bitsy. I'm so excited. Chapter 8 the top producers' meeting, as Gwen referred to it, was to be held, to Bitsy's surprise, in Olga Jameson's home. Perhaps Olga's investors were mostly the types who were impressed by genuine, gold-plated bathroom fixtures and black marble porticos. It was a psychological technique. In such surroundings, Olga and Jason's poor, misguided marks would be much more easily talked into believing they, too, could live in garish splendor if only they invested enough in InstaWealth 365. Bitsy clutched nervously at the handle of her tote bag. She'd left Shady Grove with Gwen, and they'd set off for the meeting in Gwen's car, but not before Bitsy had made a trip to the bathroom, where she'd texted both Nick and Liz, explaining where she was going. She didn't tell Stan and warned Liz to inform him on a strictly need-to-know basis. On the way to the meeting, Bitsy had found out what vetted meant. She was supposed to bring a stack of money with her. She wouldn't be expected to give up her money on the spot, Gwen insisted. It was all part of the wealth genesis process. New recruits were taken through a guided visualization, Gwen explained, where they stared at a stack of $100 bills and imagined them multiplying. But what if I decide I'm ready to invest? Bitsy asked. You certainly can invest on the spot if you feel ready. But there's absolutely no pressure. The program sells itself. After that, they'd stopped off at an ATM so Bitsy could withdraw her own personal stack of $100 bills to use in the visualization process. Bitsy couldn't resist asking why all the participants couldn't use the same stack of $100 bills at the meeting. It sure would save a lot of people making trips to the ATM and carrying around ridiculous amounts of cash, but Gwen explained the visualization wouldn't be nearly as effective if you didn't do it with your own money. It must be a test. Anyone willing to go to an ATM and withdraw a thousand dollars worth of bills was both in possession of a thousand dollars to invest and trusting enough to tote it around at the behest of strangers. Just as Bitsy and Gwen pulled up at Olga's house, Gwen said, you know, Monica really had it out for these people for some reason. She even went so far as to tell me the two of them were having an affair. Olga and Jason? Yes, I don't know why she'd make up such a horrible rumor, just to try to convince me to pull out of their business? Monica probably wasn't the source of the rumor about Olga and Jason's affair. Although, it could be just that, a rumor. She'd keep her eyes open and see if she could uncover anything to support or refute the theory, although what bearing the shenanigans of those two could possibly have on Monica's disappearance, Bitsy couldn't imagine. Bitsy had no idea what to expect as she looked around Olga Schmidt's spacious living room. There were about 20 power investors present at the meeting. They were a diverse group, although there was an overrepresentation of the 60-plus crowd. Bitsy soon figured out Power Investor was code for anyone who'd invested 50000 or more. Bitsy was relieved Jane Barton wasn't there. So far, Bitsy had managed to put on a successful facade of interest. She'd never have been able to fool Jane Barton into thinking she was interested in investing in InstaWealth 365, 
Not after how frank she'd been with Jane about her conviction, the whole thing was practically a Ponzi scheme. There were a handful of other guests who'd been brought along by other power investors, and they all seemed to be taken in by the prospect hook, line, and sinker. One portly middle-aged man was so excited he bounced up and down on his folding chair, threatening to break it. The meeting started out with a pep talk by Jason. He was clearly the opening act. After that, each power investor was invited to report how much they'd earned since the last meeting. They also reported how many people they'd signed up for the scheme. All of them had signed up someone, and a few of them had hooked dozens of poor, misguided dupes. Then Olga took over and led the guests through the Wealth Genesis visualization. The guests were all instructed to put their stacks of $100 bills on a table that had been placed at the center of the circle of folding chairs. Then each guest was told to stand over their pile of money while the group chanted. Do you believe it? The circle chanted. Yes, the guests shouted back. Are you going to be rich? Yes. Beyond your wildest dreams? Yes. This cycle of chanting went on for what felt like at least ten minutes, to Bitsy. It got louder and louder as time wore on. The whole thing was supremely weird to Bitsy, but then she'd never been involved with anything of this sort, so perhaps she was the only one who was a little freaked out by it all. When the chanting was over, Bitsy started to put her money back in her tote bag, but she was the only one. All the other guests said they wanted to invest on the spot. Don't you want to be rich? Olga asked, Bitsy. Olga was smoothing her sleek platinum blonde bob and smiling so widely it looked as if her face would crack, but when Bitsy looked into her blue eyes, she could see Olga was angry with her for balking. I'll have to talk to my boyfriend about it, said Bitsy, as if she had some terribly controlling man back home who kept track of every penny she spent. It wasn't a good excuse, but it was the only one she could come up with at such short notice. Don't let any man come between you and your dreams, said Olga. Come on, everyone, let's give Bitsy a little support here. Do you believe it? Everyone chanted. Bitsy wanted to shout N.O. at the top of her lungs and tell everyone what fools they were being, but instead, she said, yes. Are you going to be rich? Yes. Beyond your wildest dreams? Yes, said Bitsy, packing up the last of her money and returning to her seat. The chanting petered out. There was a heavy air of disapproval and disappointment in the room. Gwen had promised no pressure, but if this was no pressure, then Bitsy would hate to see what Olga and Jason's hard sell tactics looked like. Bitsy pasted a smile on her face and kept a close grip on her tote bag of cash. I really can't right now, she said to the group. If you knew my boyfriend, you'd understand. Bitsy left Olga's house feeling as if she'd gained nothing from the experience. She hadn't seen anything in the interactions between Olga and Jason to indicate they might be having an affair. If anything, they seemed like an old married couple who'd long ago taken up sleeping in separate bedrooms and were staying together for the sake of the children. The only thing Bitsy had gleaned from the bizarre experience was the conviction that Olga clearly had the upper hand in the relationship. She was the mastermind and the driving force. Jason was slick and well-spoken, but clearly the subordinate. The next morning, Bitsy woke up early. She could have slept late because she didn't have to be at the bakery until 10, but she'd slept fitfully and awakened from a bad dream just before dawn. In her dream, she was being chased down Main Street Little Creek, clutching a suitcase full of cash. A mob was in hot pursuit, some inexplicably dressed in chicken suits, and chanting, Do you want to be rich? as they ran. What do you think, Max? Bitsy said to her cat as they sat in the kitchen. Bitsy was drinking a cup of coffee, and Max was wolfing down a can of Svelte Kitty Deluxe Tuna Surprise. Bitsy couldn't help wondering what was so surprising about a can full of tuna byproducts, but then she knew nothing about marketing. Maybe she should do a surprise cupcake. All the cupcakes would look the same from the outside, but the fillings could be anything. Scratch that. People might claim to like surprises, but they rarely actually did. Bitsy certainly didn't like the surprise she got when she turned on the local morning news. 
Sometime between 2 and 4 a.m., Little Creek Police report that a woman in her 30s is believed to have jumped off a bridge on County Road 48 just outside of Little Creek. A motorist reported a dark blue Ford SUV with Arkansas plates was abandoned on the bridge. When police arrived at the scene, they found the car running and the driver's side door open. The identity of the victim is being withheld pending notification of family members. The television went to commercial. Bitsy switched it off. She was going hot and cold. Please, don't be Monica. Please, don't be Monica, she heard herself say out loud. With trembling fingers, she dialed Stan. You've heard, I'm guessing? Stan said as soon as he'd picked up. Is it Monica? Bitsy asked, not wanting to hear Stan say it was, but knowing he would. I'm sorry, Bitsy. I don't believe it. I heard from Officer Gladwell this morning. They hadn't found a body as of an hour ago, but that's not too surprising considering how high the bridge is and how fast that river flows. It could be days or weeks, realistically. Could someone survive a jump off that bridge? Almost anything is possible, theoretically, Bitsy, Stan paused as if trying to find something more comforting to say and failing but it isn't very likely. The water is lower this time of year, and anyone jumping off would be crushed on the rocks, before being washed downstream. Oh, said Bitsy. Did Gladwell tell you anything else? Not about Monica. But you will probably be interested to know young Seth Jameson's excuse for attacking women and trying to cut off their hair. Apparently, he was quite systematic about it. When they took him in, he was carrying a checklist of past and potential victims in his backpack. So, what was his excuse? Bitsy asked. He claimed he was participating in the Rapunzel Challenge, Stan said. What in the world in the Rapunzel Challenge? Well, according to Seth, it's all the rage among teenage boys to see how many locks of hair they can collect. He says they post videos to the internet cataloging their exploits. I never heard of such a thing, said Bitsy. Is it some sort of sexual fetish? I'm sure it is, in some cases, but not as far as I know, in the case of young Seth and his friends. Just kids being really, really stupid. He's lying, said Bitsy with conviction. You mean about it not being a fetish? No, I don't believe it's anything like that, either. I believe Seth is lying about the very existence of any Rapunzel challenge although you certainly do have to give him points for creativity. Stan, as usual, refused to be baited into coaxing Bitsy into divulging any of her more wild-eyed theories. There's been another very interesting development regarding Seth, said Stan. Apparently, when Gladwell and his partner went by Jameson's house to talk to Seth's parents, they discovered Seth had run away, or at least that's what his parents are saying. Run away? Well, they couldn't or wouldn't produce the boy, at any rate, Stan said. And, according to Gladwell, they found something suspicious at the house, but they can't go back and poke around until they get a search warrant. What kind of suspicious something? Bitsy asked. Not sure, Gladwell didn't seem to want to say, so I didn't push him on it. I like doing reserve duty, from time to time, so I'm intent on staying on his good side even if asking more questions would please my nosy little sister. Bitsy did not dignify that accusation with a reply. I'll keep you posted if I find out anything else, Stan continued. Has anyone tracked down Dale yet? Bitsy asked. Surely, he should be the first to know. No, and I'm afraid this development doesn't look very good for him. The media is reporting it as an assumed suicide but it might just as easily be a creative way of disposing of a body and making it look like one. That possibility had already occurred to Bitsy. Either way, Stan continued, there's very little reason to believe Monica is still alive. I'm afraid whether she really did jump or whether she was thrown over the railing, sooner or later, search and rescue is going to recover a body from that river. Bitsy couldn't argue with that. It was entirely logical. It was irrational to go on hoping Monica might still be hiding out somewhere for reasons unknown. It was all over. She needed to move on and let the police do their job. There was nothing more she could do for Monica. 
except Bitsy couldn't move on. Her resolution to stay out of it lasted only until she'd finished her cup of coffee. I just don't believe Monica's dead, Bitsy said to Max, who sat staring expectantly at his bowl in hopes of a second helping of svelte kitty tuna surprise, which he certainly was not getting. He was supposed to be on a reducing diet, according to the vet. Max looked up at Bitsy and meowed pathetically as if to say he'd gotten stuck with the stingiest pet owner ever. I'm going to look for Dale one more time before I go to the bakery, Bitsy told Max as she picked up her shoes. On the way over to Dale and Monica's house, Bitsy tried calling Dale's phone, but a cheerful recorded voice told her the number she was dialing was not available at this time. It seemed Dale's phone either had a dead battery or was switched off. Bitsy called Monica's phone once more, which rang and rang until it went to voicemail. Bitsy didn't leave a message. It was too weird to talk to a woman who might be dead. When Bitsy arrived at Dale and Monica's house, she went up to the door and knocked. No answer. She waited a couple of minutes and knocked again. There was no sign of anyone being home, but Bitsy persisted, beating on the door with her fists. From the back of the house, a dog began to bark. Bitsy hadn't known Monica and Dale had a dog, but when she went around the side of the house to investigate, she was exuberantly greeted by a young golden retriever. Bitsy petted him over the fence. You didn't get left here all by yourself, did you? She asked the dog as she read the tag dangling from his collar. His name was Marley, and, other than being desperate for affection, he seemed to be perfectly fine. Bitsy peered through the fence and saw a bowl mounted up with dog food and a fresh pan of water next to Marley's doghouse. It was obvious someone had recently been there to take care of the dog. Had it been Dale? Or someone else? And, if it had been someone else, then who? Chapter 9 Bitsy was worked off her feet as soon as she got to the bakery. They seemed twice as busy as usual. Bitsy felt like she and Nick hadn't spent any quality time together since that evening they'd gone out to eat with Sybil. In fact, she'd just been too preoccupied with Monica's disappearance to worry about what Nick's mother thought of her. By mid-afternoon, Bitsy was bone-tired. She decided to sneak into the office for a short break and to get off her feet. Hector and Annabel, the morning bakers, had gone home, and it was just Bitsy and Nick. For the moment, there were no customers. Nick followed her into the office. I feel like I haven't really seen you in days, other than in passing, Nick said. I know what you mean. She'd been keeping things from Nick. Too many things. Bitsy decided to come clean about what she'd been doing with her precious free time instead of spending it with handsome bakers. Wow, said Nick when Bitsy was done telling her story. I really wish you wouldn't go off on these wild goose chases by yourself. I didn't mean to go out to the old Marson place on my own, Bitsy said. It just worked out that way. Otherwise, I was perfectly safe. I suppose you're not done, said Nick. Even though it appears Monica's disappearance has turned into a recovery mission. No, said Bitsy. She hesitated. There were a couple more places she wanted to check out. She decided to be honest with Nick. Surely, if she promised to take him with her, he wouldn't worry. There are some loose ends I'd like to tie up, Bitsy said. Although, they'll probably just be dead ends. If I could get Liz to cover closing this evening, how would you feel about doing a little skulking around with me? What did you have in mind? I have never driven by the Jameson's place, and I want to go back to that farm, although it's going to be too dark to do that this evening. I have a feeling something bad happened there. I just can't stop thinking about Fred from Speedy Pete's telling me he thinks Monica's car was parked near there the day she went missing. Okay, said Nick. I'll go with you if you can get Liz to cover for us, but I draw the line at breaking and entering. Liz agreed to come in to close and sounded greatly relieved to learn that wherever Bitsy was going, she was taking Nick with her. I worry about you, said Liz. Taking off on your own like you do. By five o'clock, Nick and Bitsy were on the road to Fayetteville to drive by Jason and Hannah Jameson's house, but just as they were coming into the outskirts of Fayetteville, Bitsy's oil light came on. 
this thing isn't leaking oil again, is it? She wailed. It was a rhetorical question. She'd had her car to the mechanic three times in the last six months, and each time they'd claimed to have found the leak, only to have it start up again in a month or two. I really should have learned to carry a couple of extra quarts by now, said Bitsy. Nick was too diplomatic to agree with her. Instead, he said, there's a store up there, let's get some before we go on. When they were approaching the checkout line, motor oil in hand, Bitsy abruptly grabbed Nick by the arm. We have to get in line at check stand 5? Why? I'll tell you later, but for right now, just act natural. Bitsy led Nick to check stand 5 and put her three quarts of oil down on the belt. She reached for the rubber divider and placed it between her oil and the items of the shopper in front of her. A well-dressed, freakishly fit 40-ish woman with an impeccably coiffured head and what looked like a very complex professional manicure and expensive highlights stood in line ahead of them. The woman was buying an assortment of things, mostly snack foods, but she'd also purchased one of those pay-as-you-go cell phones, a bottle of dark brown hair dye, and a box of tampons. When they got out of the store, Bitsy said, we have to follow that woman. What woman? That woman who was in line in front of us. What about the oil? Bitsy was keeping a sharp eye on the woman, who was parked three rows away and had already loaded her purchases. The woman got in her car and started the engine but must have gotten a phone call just as she was preparing to back out because she sat in her idling car with her phone to her ear. Never mind the oil, Bitsy insisted. You might ruin your engine, Nick said. Who is that woman? Get in the car, and I'll explain. Bitsy got in the driver's seat and started up, watching and waiting for the woman to pull out. I'm almost certain that's Hannah, she told Nick. Hannah? Hannah Jameson, the wife of Jason Jameson, one of the partners in InstaWealth 365. Are you sure? Have you ever met her? I'm pretty sure it's her. I saw several pictures of her when I scoured the internet for information on the Jameson family. I hope you never stalk me like that, said Nick jokingly. I won't if you never break up with me, Bitsy said, then wished she hadn't. It was too early in their relationship to joke about things like breaking up. She's moving, said Nick. Hannah Jameson pulled out of the parking lot, and Bitsy tailed her at a discreet distance. She's not going home, said Bitsy. I know where their house is, and this is in the opposite direction. Maybe she has other errands to run, Nick suggested. Maybe. Nick was right. Hannah pulled into a pizza place, went inside, and came out ten minutes later carrying a pizza. Bitsy pulled away from the curb where she'd been waiting and continued following Hannah to a seedy older section of town, where she turned into the parking lot of a dilapidated motel. Bitsy pulled in after her and parked on the other end of the parking lot. They watched as Hannah removed her recent purchases from her trunk and walked up the stairs to the long open-air walkway, which served as access to the rooms on the second floor. Hannah stopped at the second door from the end of the building and knocked. The door opened, although the occupant was hidden from view, and Hannah disappeared inside. She remained inside for almost an hour, then emerged empty-handed and drove away. Why aren't you following her? Nick asked. Aren't you interested in her anymore? I'm still very interested, said Bitsy. It's just that I'm even more interested in who is occupying that room. Let's go knock on the door. Before Nick could object, Bitsy was out of the car and halfway up the stairs. Nick had to jog to catch up with her. Bitsy repeatedly knocked on the door, but there was no answer. The curtain at the window did not move. Bitsy placed her ear to the door and listened but could hear no sounds from within. How would you feel about coming back here before work tomorrow? Bitsy asked as she stood in the parking lot and watched Nick as he belatedly topped off her oil reserves. Why? Because if whoever is in that room happens to check out in the morning, I'd like to get inside before housekeeping cleans the room. Tuesday was an eerie repeat of Monday. Bitsy awoke too early and shuffled out to the kitchen, where she gave Max a can of svelte kitty chicken casserole. It looked to Bitsy like a can full of ground-up bits of the least appetizing parts of the chicken. 
She wasn't at all sure where the casserole part came in, but she had to admit if the Svelte Kitty Company had decided to emblazon their cans with the words ground up slop from the slaughterhouse floor, she'd have not been very likely to have bought her beloved Max anything made by Svelte Kitty. Bitsy made herself a cup of coffee and turned on the news. At first, she thought she must be dreaming, or perhaps, the news station had accidentally run a tape of yesterday's news in place of current footage. Bitsy stared at the screen as the reality of what she saw sunk in. Another person was presumed to have jumped off the County Road 48 bridge just outside of Little Creek. And, just as Monica's car had been abandoned the day before, this desperate person, too, appeared to have left their car parked in the center of the bridge, keys in the ignition and the motor running. The only difference this time, the newscaster noted, was that the abandoned car had an occupant, a young male golden retriever. Just as on the previous day, the anchorman gave his standard line that the victim's name could not be released until his next of kin had been notified. The news segment ended with the note that the police were investigating possible links between the two remarkably similar incidents. It was Dale. Bitsy was sure of it. It had to be. Who else could it be? She couldn't help wondering who had taken custody of poor Marley. Bitsy dialed Stan's number. He answered after about eight rings. It's awfully early, Bitsy, he chided. You haven't seen the early morning news? Not in my sleep, no. Or talked to Gladwell or anyone down at the police station? No, not since yesterday. Well, there have been developments. Bitsy told Stan what the news had reported. I'll see what I can find out, Stan said grimly and hung up. Bitsy had agreed to meet Nick at 7 to drive over to Fayetteville and stake out the motel again. You really think you're going to see anything? Nick complained. I mean, we could sit there all day and not. Just give me until 9 or so, said Bitsy. After that, if whoever has that room hasn't checked out, they probably aren't going to. I'm not interested in pawing through anyone's trash cans, said Nick. You won't have to do any pawing, Bitsy insisted. You can stand sentry duty. Nick looked less than thrilled at the prospect. On the drive over, Bitsy told Nick about the second jumper from the County Road 48 bridge. This makes a total of three missing persons, Bitsy said. Three? Yes, counting Seth Jameson, who is presumed to have run away from home. When they reached the motel, the cleaning crew was already starting to work. Evidently, whoever had occupied the upper-level second room from the end had already departed because the door was propped open, and a cleaning cart stood outside. Bitsy decided to take a gamble on a little white lie. She was getting way too good at the half-truth. She reached up and removed one of her dangly silver earrings and zipped it into the pocket of her jacket. What are you doing? Nick asked. Is that supposed to be some kind of fashion statement? Maybe it is, said Bitsy, or maybe I'm just not choosing to reveal my methods. Bitsy got out of the car and went up the stairs to the upper access balcony with Nick in tow. Let me do the talking, she whispered as they neared the open door of the room. I know, I know, said Nick. You already made it abundantly clear I'm just muscle. Bitsy tapped on the door to alert the maid someone was entering the room. She could live with herself for telling the odd white lie, but she drew the line at traumatizing members of the cleaning staff. Hello, Bitsy called out. She looked around the room and saw the trash cans had not yet been emptied. Perfect. A woman with a name badge proclaiming she was Penny emerged from the bathroom wielding a toilet bowl brush. Hi, Bitsy said, as she smiled her most ingratiating smile. I'm awfully sorry to bother you, but I was staying in this room last night, and I think I lost an earring here. Bitsy pointed to the single remaining earring in her ear. Did you happen to find one like this? No, said Penny. But you can look around if you want. I haven't done this room yet, so it might still be here. Bitsy breathed a sigh of relief. Penny believed her. The maid must not have seen who had actually stayed in that room the night before. You want to look through the bathroom trash before I throw it in with the rest? Penny asked and thrust the can into Bitsy's hands. 
Bitsy looked down at the can. Clearly, whoever had occupied the room the night before had needed the tampons which Hannah had purchased. Someone had also used that bottle of hair dye because the empty bottle now peeked out from the other trash. Bitsy looked at the almost full can and lost courage. There was no way she was going through that wastebasket without a pair of gloves. I'll leave it till last, Bitsy said. Ned, why don't you look under the furniture while I check the other trash cans? Ned? Nick mouthed behind Penny's head. Bitsy just gave him a big grin and went to work on the wastebasket next to the nightstand. There were several chip and candy bar wrappers that Bitsy recognized from seeing Hannah's purchases the previous evening. The package for the cell phone was there, as well. Propped against the can was a pizza box. Bitsy opened it. The pizza itself was gone, but whoever had eaten it evidently didn't care for cheese because they'd removed most of it and left it behind in a congealed mass. Got it, said Bitsy loudly enough for Penny to hear from the bathroom, where she continued to swish and scrub. It had fallen down between the bed and the nightstand. Bitsy held up the earring she'd taken from her pocket and replaced it in her ear. Thanks for letting us look, Bitsy said loudly in the direction of the open bathroom door. Penny peeked out the door of the bathroom. No problem. Glad you were able to find it. Well, that was a waste of time, Nick said on the way to the car. On the contrary, Bitsy insisted. It was extremely illuminating. My mind is set at ease. Monica McCall is definitely still alive, and Hannah Jameson is helping her stay that way. Chapter 10 Bitsy and Nick arrived back at the bakery in time to relieve Annabel and Hector. Nick took over the front from Annabel, and Bitsy set to work frosting a freshly cooled batch of banana cream cupcakes Hector had baked earlier that morning. As she frosted, Bitsy pondered what her next move should be. It was all very well to find hair dye and a pay-as-you-go cell phone packaging in the trash can of a seedy motel room. It was quite another to go to the police, claiming a woman they presumed dead was really hiding out somewhere. Bitsy was convinced Monica had been in that room. She just couldn't figure out why. Was it possible that the missing Monica had never been missing at all? Was her staged suicide just a way of convincing everyone she was dead, so she could bump off her husband, who was now missing as well? Bitsy found it very hard to believe Monica was capable of murder. There had to be another reason for Monica and Dale's bizarre behavior. Bitsy decided that at her first opportunity, she'd try to have another talk with Gwen. Bitsy hadn't seen Monica's mother since they'd gone to that InstaWealth 365 meeting together, but she hadn't left on poor terms with Gwen, so perhaps, the woman would still be willing to talk. Gwen Sanderson was hardly discreet by nature. Of one thing, Bitsy was convinced, when Gwen had told her Monica had contacted her after she'd gone missing, the woman had been telling the truth. Bitsy firmly believed Monica was still alive. She was equally convinced that Monica would have contacted her mother to tell her she hadn't really jumped off a bridge to her death. Besides Gwen, there was another person Bitsy dearly wanted to interview, Hannah Jameson. There was a reason Hannah was helping Monica, but Bitsy couldn't figure out what it might be. As soon as she'd finished frosting the entire batch of banana cream cupcakes, Bitsy went into the tiny bakery office, sat down on the swivel chair behind the desk, and dialed Gwen's number. Hello, Bitsy. Gwen answered in a tone entirely inconsistent with a mother mourning the death of her beloved daughter. Have you made up your mind to invest? I saw the news about Monica, Bitsy said, getting straight to the point. Oh, that, Gwen said. They got it wrong. Reporters are always getting things like that wrong? Are they? said Bitsy. So, Monica's fine? You've heard from her? Yes, Gwen said. She called just last night. Said I probably wouldn't hear from her for a while, but not to worry. She said she was perfectly fine. I'm telling you in the strictest confidence, of course. Of course. Gwen probably had told a dozen other people the same thing in strictest confidence. Bitsy wondered if the gossip hadn't already gotten as far as the police station, although maybe it had, 
and the police were already shifting their investigation to account for the possibility of Monica McCall still being very much alive. Why did she do it? Bitsy asked Gwen. Leave her car on the bridge? I don't know. She wouldn't tell me. Gwen paused. When she started speaking again, she sounded a little choked up. I feel really bad about Dale, though. I never did like him much, but if I'd had any idea he'd take Monica leaving him that badly, I'd have encouraged her to find a gentler way of breaking up. Clearly, Gwen believed Dale had jumped off that bridge to his death. Bitsy wasn't quite so sure herself, but she could hardly float the idea to Gwen that there was a slim chance of her daughter being a murderess. He left a note, you know, Gwen continued. It was in the car. It was written to me, asking me to take their dog, Marley. He said he was sorry. He didn't have much family to speak of. Are you sure the note was in his handwriting? It looked like it to me. He didn't leave a note for anyone else? Nothing for his business partner? Gregory? No. You know it's strange. I would have thought Gregory would be really broken up about it, seeing as those two have been friends since they were just little boys, but when I saw him yesterday, he didn't seem sad, more worried like. Maybe he's the stoic type, Bitsy suggested. Or maybe he's too frantic about finding that runaway boy of his to have any emotional bandwidth left to deal with Dale's death? Maybe, said Gwen. He's a strange one. A lot of people might think Gwen was the strange one insisting she was having regular conversations with a daughter who was officially a missing person, but Bitsy restrained herself from pointing that out. Were Hannah Jameson and Monica friends? Jason's wife? I doubt she and Monica have ever even met. I've seen pictures of Jason's family, but Hannah doesn't ever come to any InstaWealth meetings. She's a real homebody, I guess. Interesting. There's something I don't quite understand, Bitsy said. If Dale is dead, and he was the reason Monica wanted to remain a missing person, then why doesn't she come back home? There was a long silence on the other end of the line. It seemed Gwen had not yet considered this question herself. I don't know, Gwen said at last, but I'm sure she has her reasons. Bitsy looked up to see Nick standing in the doorway of the office, motioning to her that she was needed out front. I'm sorry, Gwen, Bitsy said. But I have to go. I'm glad to hear Monica's fine. Then Bitsy hurriedly said goodbye and hung up before Gwen had time to talk her into putting money into InstaWealth 365. Gregory Schmidt is here, Nick said. Bitsy went out front to where Gregory stood at the bulletin board they kept near the entrance for community members to post flyers about events and local tradespersons to leave their cards. He was stapling up a poster with Seth's face on it. Have you seen this boy? The poster asked. Seth looked just as morose in the picture as he had the only time Bitsy had seen him in person. Hi, I'm Bitsy. Bitsy stuck out her hand, and Gregory put down his stapler to shake it. Is there anything else we can do to help? Bitsy asked. If Gregory Schmidt wasn't sad about the apparent death of his friend, as Gwen claimed, he was certainly distraught about something. He looked like a man who'd spent a great deal of time crying and very little time sleeping. Thanks, Gregory said. I appreciate that, but I don't know what else to do. Nobody's seen him, and the police don't seem to know what to do. Has Seth ever run away before? Bitsy asked. Gregory hesitated. Once, about a year ago. He was gone less than 24 hours, though, the first time. Where did you find him? We didn't find him. He came home on his own. He'd been hiding out at a friend's house. But you're sure he isn't doing the same thing this time? We searched the homes of every friend he has. It didn't take long. Seth is a bit of a loner. Do you know why he ran away? Bitsy asked. Well. Gregory hesitated. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to pry. That was a lie. She did mean to pry, but it certainly wouldn't be polite to admit it. No, it's okay. There's no point in keeping secrets. He and his mother had a big fight the evening before he went missing. 
she told him he was an embarrassment to the family. I'm sure you've heard he got arrested. I did hear something about it. I don't know why he'd do something so stupid, Gregory said. He's always been such a gentle child. To this day, if someone finds a spider in the house, he'll insist on carefully picking it up and taking it outside. It's totally out of character for him to attack anyone, let alone strange women, at random. He claimed it was all part of some social media challenge, but he's never been one to get caught up in juvenile pranks, certainly not violent, dangerous ones. Bitsy had a pretty good idea why the apparently gentle Seth might do something as bizarre as attack strange women and cut off a bit of their hair, and it had nothing to do with juvenile challenges, but she decided now was not the moment to spring her theory on Seth's distressed father. Well, I'll certainly keep my eyes and ears open, Bitsy said to Gregory. I hope and pray you find your son soon and bring him home safely. Bitsy again retreated to the office and sat there, for a few minutes, her chin in her hands, trying to think of a way to get Hannah Jameson to talk to her, but she couldn't come up with one. At six, Nick locked the front door and turned over the closed sign. Want to come over for supper, he asked. I'll make spaghetti. Sounds great, but I'll need to stop by my house and give Max his supper. I'll be over there in about an hour. At home, while she rested her feet as Max wolfed down his svelte kitty deluxe fish fillet, which neither looked nor smelled deluxe and certainly didn't resemble a fillet, Bitsy turned on the television. The evening news was wrapping up. This just in, the cheerful newscaster said, possible new developments in the case of two Little Creek residents missing and presumed to be dead. Surveillance footage taken at a local ATM appears to show a man and a woman making a transaction during the same time period late yesterday evening when the missing couple's bank account was emptied using a stolen ATM card. Police have provided us with the footage, and anyone having any information about the identity or whereabouts of the person shown is encouraged to contact the Little Creek Police Department. The footage was grainy black and white and shot from above, so both the man and the woman, who were wearing caps and dark clothing, were impossible to identify with any certainty, but based on their body size and relative height to one another, they could have been Dale and Monica. Bitsy switched off the television and gave Max a pat on the head before heading out the door to Nick's. Nick had supper ready by the time Bitsy arrived. They'd sat down to dinner and Bitsy had just taken her first bite when her phone rang. It was Stan. You haven't told me what you've been up to, said Stan, skipping the preliminaries. But realistically, it's too much to hope you've decided to stay out of things, so I thought you might want to know the latest developments in the Monica McCall case. We're eating right now, Bitsy told Stan. We? I'm at Nick's house. That man looking after you properly? By looking after, Stan meant not letting you do anything dangerous. Who said I need looking after? Bitsy protested. I'll call you back when we're done with supper. Immediately after the flan, which Bitsy had no idea when Nick had found the time to whip up, she returned Stan's call. You'll see a version of this on the news tomorrow, Stan said. But there are some aspects of it you won't hear. You mean about the ATM footage? Bitsy asked her brother. I saw the news report on that. No, that's pretty straightforward, said Stan. This is considerably more sensational. Oh? Are you trying to keep me in suspense? No, this is far too serious a matter to joke around about. What is it? Olga Schmidt has gone missing, and the police found bloodstains at the Schmidt residence. Oh. But not in that order, Stan continued. Remember I told you how when Gladwell and his partner went to the Schmidt residence to interview the parents after they'd picked up that teenage son of theirs for the scissor attacks? Yeah. I mentioned they'd seen something suspicious, but Gladwell didn't seem to want to say what it was. Yeah. Well, it turns out the something suspicious was an apparent bloodstain on the tile under a throw rug in the Schmidt's foyer but when they went back with the search warrant, the stain had been scrubbed, and the throw rug had disappeared. Oh. One of the officers found the rug in a dumpster next to the clubhouse in Schmidt's subdivision. Olga Schmidt had a story prepared. 
She claimed the bloodstain was from a dog of theirs who'd cut his foot and bled all over the foyer. How likely do you think that story is to be true? Bitsy asked. Not very, Stan said. Not given the timing and the fact that when the officers searched the house, it became abundantly clear the family currently does not own a dog. It could have died, or they could have gotten rid of it. That's what Olga claimed, she said it died two weeks ago, but she couldn't produce any pictures showing the kids or any other member of the family with deer, departed Fido. They'll send the rug off for testing? Yes, but it'll take a while to get the results back. In the meantime, Olga's gone missing, which makes her the second member of the Schmidt family to disappear in a matter of days. You don't think it's possible she took off in search of Seth? Bitsy suggested. This seemed unlikely. If either of the Schmidt parents were going to take off looking for their runaway boy, then Gregory was the far more likely of the two. Gladwell said since the Schmidt boy ran away, the father's been calling the station ten times a day, asking if there have been any developments, but the mother hasn't said boo. It was Gregory who took the missing person flyers around town, Bitsy told Stan. You don't suppose? That Olga Schmidt had something to do with the disappearance of her son? Yes, although I can hardly bear to contemplate such a horrible possibility. Or it could be the other way around. You mean Seth could have resurfaced and done something to his mother? They had a fraught relationship, Stan pointed out. I don't think either is a very likely possibility, said Bitsy. I have reason to believe Monica McCall is still alive. What? You have been up to things you haven't been telling me about. You're not suggesting Monica McCall is responsible for Olga Schmidt's disappearance? I know there was bad blood between them, but if Monica McCall has been staging an elaborate hoax to cover up a murder. I don't think that's what happened, Bitsy said. Then what do you think did happen? Stan asked. I haven't quite put all the pieces together yet, but when I do, you'll be the first to know. Whenever you're ready, Stan said with maddening nonchalance. That brother of hers was really infuriating sometimes, although she was grateful he wasn't pressing her to expound on her theory. There were too many loose threads still, but she had a good idea of the one person who would be able to help her gather them up and make sense of all the events that had happened if only she could track that person down. The police really have no idea where Seth might have gone? Not a clue. I was the one who took the father's statement. Mortimer's been out on medical leave, so I've been filling in a lot lately. Do you know how Seth left the house? Did he take anything with him? I believe he left on a bicycle and had a backpack with him, but we're not sure what was in it. He left his phone and tablet behind. His father was able to unlock both of those, but there were no texts or messages indicating he was planning to meet someone. Where he might have gone is a complete mystery. Did he leave a note? Bitsy asked. Yes, to his dad. It just said he was sorry, and he'd come home when he found out the truth, but his father didn't seem to have any idea what the boy might be referring to. Is it known if he took any money with him? His father seemed to think so. Evidently, Seth is extremely frugal. He'd been saving up his entire allowance, which, according to his father, was quite generous, as well as money he earned as a paperboy, for over a year. His father doesn't know for sure where Seth kept his stash of cash, but it wasn't found in his room, so it's assumed he took it with him. What about those locks of hair he cut off all those women? What's happened to them? Gladwell tried to get either Seth or his parents to produce them, so they could be entered into evidence, tying him to the other attacks, which Seth freely admitted to. But when the police tried to collect them, Seth refused to say where he'd hidden them, and both parents claimed ignorance. Gregory Schmidt said he turned Seth's room upside down after he ran away and searched the entire house looking for any clue where Seth might have gone, but the hair never turned up. Likewise, when the police went back with a search warrant, they didn't find it. Maybe Seth threw it away after documenting his exploits on the internet. Did anyone track down any video of Seth showing off his stolen locks of hair? No, Seth claimed to have a few alter ego social media accounts in addition to his regular ones, but he refused to divulge his secret usernames, and, frankly, 
the police have a lot bigger fish to fry, so I doubt anyone will be expending any effort on finding them, Stan said. Did Gregory Schmidt mention anything about unusual charges to any of their credit cards around the time Seth disappeared? No. You think Seth might have purchased a plane ticket or bus fare? Possibly, Bitsy replied. She had something else entirely in mind, but it was not yet time to share her suspicions with her brother. Chapter 11 After Bitsy got home, she fired up her laptop and sat down at her kitchen table. She had some sleuthing to do regarding young Seth. The longer he was gone, the more uneasy she became. So many bad things could happen to a kid out there. It was time to get serious about finding Seth Schmidt and bringing him home. If he'd left on his bicycle and that had yet to be found, he was probably still in the area. He was a loner, and his few close friends had all sworn they knew nothing about his whereabouts. That left one primary possibility. He was hiding out somewhere familiar, someplace he had already been in the habit of spending time. Any teenage kid with half a brain wouldn't run away and check into a hotel, even if he had amassed enough cash to keep that up for a while. That would attract immediate attention. No, Seth was still somewhere in Little Creek. He was probably sleeping outdoors in the cold and having an absolutely miserable time of it. Fortunately, it hadn't snowed or rained since he'd been gone, so if he'd planned his departure in advance, he could be holed up somewhere with at least a tent and a sleeping bag. Bitsy knew some homeless people camped out on public land just on the northern outskirts of town, but Bitsy immediately rejected the notion of Seth having gone there. It was far more likely Seth would wisely stay as far away from strange adults as possible. Bitsy pulled up the missing person social media page Gregory had created just after Seth had gone missing. Bitsy had briefly perused the page before, but this time she was looking for something specific. Most of the pictures of Seth showed him on his bike. His sole hobby seemed to have been BMX trail riding. There were several pictures of him out in the woods, taking jumps off homemade obstacles which looked very much as if they'd been constructed by a small army of teenagers with shovels who probably pilfered the lumber from construction sites. One photo showed Seth balancing his bike on a round rock in the middle of a small stream. He looked much happier in that photograph than Bitsy had ever seen him. Bitsy pulled up a map of the Schmidt's neighborhood and switched to bird's eye view. From above, it was easy to see the Schmidt's posh subdivision had been built on the hillside bordering a holler, as Bitsy had been taught to refer to it growing up. From the satellite view, it appeared that at the bottom of the holler, there ran a stream that eventually dumped into Little Creek, although, at this time of year, it might be just a dry wash. Bitsy printed out an image of the subdivision and closed her laptop. It was time to go to bed. Tomorrow, she'd be up at the crack of dawn, ready to scour the woods for the missing boy. Her alarm went off at six. She hadn't told anyone where she was going, but she did take the precaution of leaving a note on the kitchen table detailing her plans. By 6.30, she was on her way to Schmidt's subdivision. Before she got there, she stopped off at a fast food restaurant and bought three egg and bacon breakfast sandwiches, a jumbo size serving of potato wedges, and a large bottle of orange juice, which she stashed in the knapsack she'd brought along. Just before she reached the entrance to the Schmidt subdivision, she pulled off on the wide shoulder. She'd spotted a trail going off into the woods. It was just after dawn, and Bitsy sat in her car for a few minutes waiting for it to get lighter. What she was expecting to spot was a shelter or tent in the woods. If Seth was bright, he'd have concealed his shelter with foliage, and it was going to be difficult to find, even in full sunlight. Bitsy finally grew so cold and stiff from sitting in the unheated car that she set off at a blood-warming pace down the trail, which disappeared into the forest. She walked for almost a mile, exploring every deer trail or dirt path which took off from the track she'd started on before she came to the first rudely constructed bike jump. This encouraged her. It wasn't one of the jumps shown in the pictures of Seth, but it was very much like it. Bitsy decided to climb up on the jump to get a better view of the area surrounding the small clearing in which the jump sat. She stood on top of the plywood ramp and surveyed the woods, but nothing caught her eye. It was only a short way down to the ground, so Bitsy decided to jump. 
that was a mistake. As she landed, her ankle twisted. It hurt so badly that she immediately cried out in pain. She remained huddled on the ground underneath the jump for several minutes, holding her ankle and willing the pain to go away. She hadn't hurt a snap, so it probably wasn't broken, but if it was simply a sprain, it was a very bad one. There wasn't any way she was making it back the mile to her car unless she hopped on one foot the whole way or crawled out on her hands and knees. Bitsy reached into her pocket and took out her cell phone. No service. She was glad she'd left a note on her kitchen table. When she didn't show up for work at 11 o'clock, Nick would call, and when he couldn't reach her, hopefully, he'd go to her house and use her hide a key to get inside. If he found her note, it shouldn't be hard for him to find her. That was hours away, however, at best. Help! Bitsy yelled as loud as she could. The woods seemed to swallow up her voice, so she cupped her hands around her mouth and yelled again. There was only silence from the forest. Bitsy yelled a third time and then decided to conserve her voice. A hiker might pass by eventually. The path was well worn. All that were was unlikely to all be the work of teenaged cyclists. In the bushes above her, Bitsy heard a rustling. Then silence. She could feel in her bones that she was being watched. Anyone there, she called out to the rustling bushes. I've got bacon and egg sandwiches. There was a long silence. I know you're there, Bitsy called out again. You might as well come out and eat these. There was a rustling again, and then a very unwashed boy slid down the dirt bank into the clearing. It was Seth. The boy approached her cautiously as if he feared she would spring up and grab him. Bitsy removed the sandwiches from her backpack, half unwrapped one, and thrust it towards him. I really am hurt, she said. I twisted my ankle looking for you, Seth. Looking for me? the boy asked. Who are you? A friend of your father's. That wasn't strictly true, but the truth was too complicated to explain. The boy grabbed the sandwich and retreated out of reach. How is my dad? I hope he's not too worried. I don't think it would be possible for him to be any more worried than he already is. Oh. Seth looked distressed at this revelation. I'll go back, he said. Just as soon as I get the thing back that I'm waiting for. You mean the analysis on all those hair samples? Seth nearly dropped what was left of his sandwich. He hurriedly stuffed it in his mouth, and Bitsy handed over the second one and the bottle of orange juice. I figured out what you'd been up to a while back. You're looking for your birth mother. I can't go to Juby until I know the truth, Seth said. Who said anything about you going to Juby? Mom did. She said it was the best place for a mentally disturbed kid like me. Bitsy remained silent. It seemed Seth didn't know his mother had disappeared, or he didn't want Bitsy to know he knew. Her instinct told her he thought his mother was at home, carrying on as usual while her child hid out in the woods. Are the results of the hair sample tests coming in the mail? Bitsy asked. Yes. Seth had clearly decided denial was useless, or he trusted her. Bitsy decided that she'd better tell him that his mother was missing. There was a possibility he could have something to do with it, but Bitsy didn't really believe it. He was clearly a miserably unhappy child, but Seth's demeanor was more in line with his father's characterization of a kid who rescued spiders and let them go outdoors. There's something you probably don't know, Bitsy said. It's not good news. Nothing happened to Megan or Connor? Or Dad? No worry about the safety of his mother? Bitsy still didn't think Seth had harmed his mother, but his lack of concern about her gave Bitsy pause. It's your mother, said Bitsy. She's been missing since the day before yesterday. She didn't come home in the evening, and the next morning your father reported her missing. Seth went pale. It was clear he was hearing the news for the first time. He did it. I knew something like this would happen. Seth was on the verge of throwing up his bacon and eggs. He put the remains of the second sandwich down and looked at Bitsy, stricken. He? You don't mean your dad, do you? Bitsy asked. 
No. Dad would never hurt anyone. Seth paused before he went on. I'm afraid Mom did something horrible. How horrible? I think she might have killed someone. Monica McCall? I don't know who the woman was, Seth said. She came to our house. It was about a week ago, a few days, before I got arrested. What happened? This strange woman came to the house. I heard arguing downstairs, so I hid at the top of the stairs and listened. It was just this strange woman and your mother at home? No, Mr. Jameson was there, too. He arrived in the middle of the argument. Your mother's business partner? Yeah. Bitsy wondered if Seth knew his mother and Jason Jameson were having an affair, if the rumors were even true. What were they arguing about? This woman said my mom had cheated her mom out of a lot of money, and the woman wanted it back. Did they argue about anything else? Not really, Seth said. The strange lady just kept calling my mother a fraud. Then one or the other of them must have started pushing and shoving because one minute they were yelling at each other, and then there was a big thump. After that, it got really quiet, and then Jason said, Olga, what have you done? What had Mr. Jameson been doing this whole time they were arguing? Bitsy asked. Not much, said Seth. At least nothing I could hear. After it got quiet, I peeked over the railing and saw this blonde woman lying on the floor in front of the door. She was bleeding from her head. It looked like she might have hit the edge of a table in the hallway as she went down, but I'm not sure what happened. I didn't see that part. Anyway, Mr. Jameson started to dial 911, I guess, but my mother stopped him. She grabbed the phone out of his hand and threw it down on the floor and broke it. What did Mr. Jameson do? He tried to get his phone back and said something about taking the woman to the hospital, then my mother threatened him. How? I didn't really understand what she was talking about. Mom said something about telling Hannah about them, but I don't know who she meant by them. Then Mom said, if you dare turn me in, you know I'll take the kids and be out of here by this time tomorrow. That really scared me. Sometimes, when she gets really mad, she'll threaten Dad like that. She'll say she's going to take us all back to Germany with her, and he'll never see us again. Then she said something about how no one would believe she had anything to do with it, whatever it was, and that she'd say Jason did it, and everyone would believe her because she had him on our security camera tape coming into the house right before it happened. I guess she meant the strange lady getting hurt like that or something. Would your mother really follow through with a threat to run off like that? Does she have a place to go back to in Germany? Probably. All her family's there. She claims they'll help her, and Dad will never get us back once she's got us out of the country. Every time she says she'll take us away, Dad looks scared, like he really believes she'll do it. Did your mother say anything else to Mr. Jameson? She said something about selling off his debt to someone not quite so sympathetic. I really don't have a clue what that was about. Jason owed Olga money? This was new information. From the sounds of it, Olga had some shady associates. She might be able to sell a private debt to someone else, prepared to take drastic measures to collect on it. So, you think Mr. Jameson did something to your mother because she threatened him? Seth didn't answer. He just looked miserable. Look, said Bitsy. We don't know anything about what's happened to your mother. She might come back tomorrow, you never know. Maybe she's just tired out and decided to take a little vacation without telling your father. She won't come back, Seth said with conviction. And if Mr. Jameson did do something horrible, it was because mom pushed him to do it. Are you talking about the strange lady who hit her head? What happened to her? Mr. Jameson took her off somewhere while she was unconscious. He said she was still breathing, and then mom said something about the farm, and Mr. Jameson agreed with her, although he didn't sound like he wanted to. Then what happened? I hit again, because they were picking her up and carrying her out to the garage. I didn't hear anything after that except the garage door opening and a car driving away. After a while, my mother came into my room, probably to make sure I hadn't heard anything. 
Dad was gone to work, and Megan and Connor were at school. I was only at home on a school day because I was getting over the flu. What did you say to your mother? Nothing. I pretended I was asleep, and I guess I fooled her into thinking I was, because she never said anything to me about it. Did you tell your dad? Yes. I told him everything I just told you, but it was a couple of days before I had a chance to get him alone. Mom seemed to be worried about leaving us alone together, so maybe she did suspect I had seen or heard something that day. What did your dad say when you told him? He said he'd take care of it and that it was really important that I make sure mom didn't find out I knew anything. Then he said something about how he was going to send all us kids off for a few days to see our grandmother in Utah, but I wasn't to say a word about it to anyone, not even Megan and Connor. He said we'd all pretend we were going together to have Sunday dinner like usual at my aunt's house, mom never goes, and that's when he'd take us to the airport. But that didn't happen? No, I ran away. Maybe dad went ahead and sent off Megan and Connor. I've been sneaking up to the mailbox the last two mornings, but I can't tell if they are still at home. Why do you think your dad wanted to send you off to your grandmother? He's afraid of mom. Everyone's afraid of her. You need to go home, Bitsy said. She'd gotten all the useful information she was going to out of Seth. It was time to take him safely back to his father. There's a slight problem, however, she continued. Finish your potato wedges and your orange juice. You're going to need that strength to help me get out of here. Bitsy raised her pant leg and displayed her rapidly swelling ankle. Under different circumstances, she'd have sent Seth off in search of help, but she couldn't trust him not to disappear again after summoning assistance. It took forever to hop far enough out of the holler to get cell reception, but about halfway back to the car Bitsy was able to get a signal. She immediately dialed Gregory Schmidt's number. I'm back in the woods behind your house, she said. Seth is with me, but I've hurt my ankle. Can you come down and get us? Gregory didn't ask any questions, and ten minutes later, he was jogging down the path toward them. He caught his son up in a tight hug, and when he finally let go, they both were crying. I'm sorry, Bitsy said. But I'm really having difficulty walking. Gregory carried her out on his back, but not before Bitsy called Liz, who agreed to bring Nick out, so he could drive her car back. There was no way Bitsy would be up to driving with that foot. After that, Bitsy said. Do you mind filling in for me at the bakery, at least the first part of the afternoon? I think I'd better go to the hospital and have this ankle looked at. Bitsy had no intention of going straight to the hospital, but she couldn't divulge her real plans in front of Gregory Schmidt. Gregory and Seth left her in her car. She declined Gregory's offer to keep her company until her friends arrived. When Nick and Liz drove up, they were both hopping mad but trying not to show it. Nick got into the driver's seat of Bitsy's car, and they followed Liz down the street. Not this way, said Bitsy when they got to an intersection. Aren't you going to the hospital? Not yet. There's somewhere else I have to be. Where? We have to go to the old Marson farm. Really? In your condition? I thought you were convinced Monica McCall is hiding out of her own free will somewhere. You found the missing boy. Haven't you done enough? Please, it's something I have to do. After that, I promise you can take me to the walk-in clinic at the hospital. Chapter 12 They drove in silence to the old Marson place. Nick drove down the gravel drive, parked in front of the old farmhouse, and shut off the engine. Well, here we are, he said. I don't know what you hope to accomplish by coming here. I have to look at the barn again, said Bitsy. The barn? Nick said. You plan to walk all the way out there on your ankle. No, I plan to get carried all the way out there. Carried? Gregory Schmidt carried me half a mile out of the woods this morning. Didn't even break a sweat, but then you aren't quite as big as Gregory, so. I see what you're doing, Nick groused, but he got out and came around to the passenger side of the car. Bitsy rode on Nick's back all the way out to the barn. 
Unlike last time, when the place had been shut tight, the large door at the end of the barn stood open. An ancient, rusting front-end loader was parked inside. Looks like someone's been digging over there, said Nick. I wonder why. He pointed to the side of the barn where an area of dirt about 10 feet by 10 feet had been scraped up and removed. Let's go inside, said Bitsy. Inside? Yes. Farm convention. First, you yell at the open barn door, and if no one answers, then it's perfectly polite to go inside and look around for the farmer. This place is derelict. There is no farmer, Nick pointed out. The principle still applies, Bitsy insisted. Don't pick me up, I'll just hop along. She hopped through the open door without waiting for Nick to reply. Yoo-hoo, she yelled, anybody home? There was silence. She hopped to the closed door of a small tack room at the end of the stalls, just inside the open barn door. She tried the knob. It opened. Come on, Bitsy said to Nick. You really think this mythical farmer's going to be down there? Inside the tack room, against the back wall, a rough stairway descended into the cellar. Bitsy hopped down it, Nick in reluctant pursuit. When she got to the bottom, she held onto the stone wall and looked around the dirt-floored cellar. Light streamed in from a small cobwebby window high up on the wall. This was not the same room she'd peeked in on the first time she'd come to the farm. This room contained a cot piled with an assortment of disreputable-looking bedding and a couple of rusty folding chairs. Look. Bitsy said to Nick and pointed to a pile of fast food boxes and snack wrappers heaped in the corner. One of our bakery boxes. She hopped over to the box and picked it up. It was the size they used for a dozen cupcakes. A few crumbs remained inside. Bitsy picked up one between her thumb and forefinger and brought it up to her nose. Strawberry caramel. You think Monica McCall was hiding out here? Nick asked. Not hiding out, exactly. Bitsy paused and looked up once more at the cobwebby window. It's gone. What's gone? The barrel. What barrel? Let's go up, I'll explain everything later. Hopping back up the stairs was too hard, so Nick picked her up and carried her all the way out of the barn. Happy now, he said. Bitsy hopped around to the side of the barn, where the barrel had been blocking the window on her first visit. It was nowhere to be seen, and the big metal lid that had caused Bitsy to stub her toe last time had also vanished. Look at those tracks, Bitsy said, pointing to the marks made by a piece of heavy equipment in the soft earth. Probably from that front-end loader. It looks like they lead all the way down to the pond. Can you go check? Nick jogged off, leaving Bitsy standing by the side of the barn. Five minutes later, he was back. It looks like that front-end loader drove right into the pond. I'm ready to go to the hospital now, Bitsy said. Are you sure, said Nick. You don't want me to search the crawl space under the house or climb up on the roof and peer down the chimney or anything while I'm at it? No, Bitsy replied primly. That won't be necessary. I have all the information I'm after. On their way to the hospital, Bitsy called Stan. I'm just leaving the old Marson place, Bitsy told her brother. Tell your boys in blue, they had better go, and fish that body out of the pond. What pond? Stan demanded. What body? I'm confident there's a dead body in an old metal barrel, sunk in the bottom of the pond at the old Marson place. Just put a bug in Gladwell's ear, to go out there and look around. It shouldn't be difficult, seeing as there was a sighting of Monica McCall's car near there. You think someone put Monica McCall in the bottom of a cow pond? Not Monica. Not Monica? Then who? I really hate to deprive the police force of feeling useful. Just get a couple of officers to go out there, and they'll soon see the need to dredge the cow pond. Think about it. There are three missing persons at this point. Did Liz tell you I found Seth Schmidt? Never mind, we can talk about that later. Anyway, my point is that there are three missing persons, all with some connection to the Jameson family, the current owners of the old Marson farm. You better be right, Bitsy, Stan said. 
because if I talk Gladwell into getting a warrant and sending someone out to dredge a cow pond and there's nothing at the bottom of it but an empty barrel, I'll never hear the end of it. Twenty-four hours later, there was a crew out at the old Marson place dragging the bottom of the pond. Stan forbade Bitsy from skulking around, but as soon as the dredging was over, he called her. You were right, he said. They just pulled out the barrel and opened it. It's hard to identify the body at this point. But it's definitely a blonde woman. I'm so sorry, Bitsy. I know you were convinced Monica McCall was still alive. I'm still convinced it's not Monica, said Bitsy. Monica is not currently a blonde. That must be Olga Schmidt, and I'm convinced Jason Jameson killed her, although he may not have had much of a choice. I have no idea what you're talking about, Stan said. You can expound on your theory to me later. The state that body is in, it's going to be a while before we get a positive identification, anyway. By the way, Liz wanted me to ask if you and Nick would like to come to dinner at our house this evening. By the time dinner rolled around, however, Stan had changed his tune about Bitsy, keeping her theories to herself. Before Liz had even dished up the first plate of chicken parmesan, Bitsy's brother said, You were right again, Bitsy. Oh, was I? About what? Stan looked embarrassed. I don't know how in the world you figured it all out, but when they brought Jason and Hannah Jameson in for questioning, they both cracked like nuts. Surely Hannah didn't have anything to do with killing Olga, Bitsy said. No, said Stan. That was all Jason's doing, although he's claiming self-defense. Before you go on, said Bitsy, who couldn't resist showing off for her big brother. Do you mind if I expound a bit on my theory? You know, before you spoil the surprise. You mean so you can say I told you so after I've finished? Stan said. Possibly. Go ahead. Wait. Liz called from the kitchen, where she was plating up supper. I want to hear this, too. When Liz emerged with the plates, Bitsy launched into her story. I'll tell you what I don't know, first, she began. That's a weird way of starting a story, Nick said. Even by your standards. Bitsy elbowed him under the table and continued. I don't know where Dale and Monica McCall are hiding out, but I'm convinced they are safe, and they are together. I do have a theory on that, but I'm not ready to share it. Okay, said Stan. But why did they go into hiding? I'll start from the beginning, the day Monica disappeared, Bitsy said. I think you'd better, said Liz. I, for one, am very confused. The morning Monica disappeared, she was sighted by a number of people while she ran errands, Bitsy began. Then, once she'd been to the bake shop and picked up her box of a dozen strawberry caramel cupcakes, no one saw her again. I know where she went next. Bitsy looked around the table to confirm she had everyone's full attention. What I'm about to tell you came from my conversation with young Seth the day I found him hiding in the woods. After Monica left the bakery, she went to the Schmidt's house with the intention of pressuring Olga Schmidt into returning Gwen's investment. While Olga and Monica were arguing, Jason Jameson arrived and remained a bystander until Monica and Olga got into a shoving match, and Monica was pushed to the floor, possibly striking her head on the edge of a table, but certainly cracking it against the tile in the foyer when she fell. According to Seth, who was eavesdropping, Jason immediately started to dial 911, but Olga stopped him before the call went through. Jason was in favor of taking the unconscious Monica to the hospital, but Olga threatened to expose her and Jason's affair to Jason's wife, Hannah, if he summoned an ambulance. Olga also made a threat to sell a large private debt he owed her to some underworld debt collectors, at least that's my interpretation of what Seth overheard. Go on, said Stan. After that, Jason was too scared to take Monica to the hospital so he allowed Olga to help him carry Monica out to one of the Schmidt's vehicles that was parked in the garage. Jason then drove to his farm and had the still knocked out Monica in the cellar under the barn. He must have done the best he could to revive her because she did. This put Jason in a very awkward situation because he was now in possession of a kidnapped woman he didn't know what to do with. I'm not sure when or how. But over the next few days, 
Unbeknownst to Olga, Hannah Jameson, Jason's wife, and Gregory Schmidt, Olga's own husband, became aware Monica was being held in the cellar under the barn. But they both had their reasons why they weren't willing to call the police? Liz said. Yes, Bitsy continued. Hannah wasn't willing to turn in her own husband, especially since she, quite rightly, believed he had done it under duress. Although, I'm certain she didn't fully understand what Olga was holding over Jason's head to force him to comply with her wishes. And Gregory? Gregory was in the same position. I don't think he was unwilling to turn his wife in, since he must have known what she was capable of. I think that's why he delayed going to the police, he was fully aware of what she could do. He was afraid if the process didn't move fast enough, at the first whiff of potential criminal prosecution, Olga would take the kids and run. But Olga didn't even care much about her kids, Liz pointed out. Why would she go on the lam with three children in tow? No, but Gregory did care about his kids, very much so, and that was Olga's main source of control over him. I personally believe she was fully capable of harming her own children, if she'd gotten mad enough, just to get revenge on Gregory for reporting her to the police. He must have known that, too, and been unwilling to act until the kids were out of harm's way. But Seth's running away complicated things, Nick interjected. Gregory told Seth he was sending them away, without telling Olga, for a visit with their grandmother in Utah, Bitsy said, but then Seth ran away, and that did complicate things. But why did Seth run away? Stan said. He was waiting for test results on the hair samples. Hair samples? Liz said. You mean all that hair he chopped off those women? Yes, said Bitsy. I think if you take a close look at that list of names he had in his backpack when the police picked him up, you'll find every single woman on it is of a suitable age to be Seth's mother. He was taking the hair to do maternity testing? Liz was aghast. You mean, he doubted that Olga was his mother? That's what she told him, although Gregory insists it was nothing but a cruel lie, spoken for the sole purpose of distressing Seth. What a truly despicable woman, said Liz. Yes, said Bitsy, and fully capable of murder. But she's the one who ended up dead, in the end, Nick noted. Yes, I'm getting to that. Anyway, I believe Monica was held in that cellar for several days while Jason, Hannah, and Gregory tried to figure out a way to let her go free without infuriating Olga. I suspect that Olga had already floated the idea of simply killing Monica and disposing of her body. Sometime on Saturday, Monica insisted on contacting Dale and her mother, although, in the case of her mother, Monica didn't tell her the whole truth. I believe by late Saturday afternoon, Dale knew everything. That's why he suddenly changed his story and began to tell everyone Monica had left him for another man. When did Seth run away? Nick asked. Sunday, the same day his father intended to send his kids off to relative safety at his mother's house in Utah. So, the others were simply buying time until Gregory could get his kids out of the way before going to the police and confessing everything? Liz asked. I suspect that was the plan, yes, said Bitsy. We have to remember Dale McCall and Gregory Schmidt were very close friends. It's not unrealistic to believe Monica and Dale might have been willing to go to drastic lengths to safeguard Gregory's children, even if it meant continued danger and a great deal of inconvenience to themselves. I suppose so, Liz agreed. When Seth disappeared, Bitsy continued, Gregory probably wasn't entirely convinced he'd run away. He could have suspected Olga had found out she'd been taken for a fool and hidden Seth away somewhere. With Olga possibly in possession of Seth, Gregory's hands were tied. I believe that's when they, Jason, Gregory, Hannah, Monica, and Dale, must have come up with the plan to stage Monica's apparent suicide. I'm guessing the plan was for Jason to tell Olga he'd killed Monica and come up with that creative way of disposing of both her body and the car, which I believe was parked inside the barn at the farm, right up until the morning Monica was thought to have jumped off the bridge. But what about Dale? Liz asked. He didn't really die, did he? Chapter 13 No, Dale's still very much alive. 
I expect they decided a staged copycat suicide was the most believable way for Dale to quickly disappear, so he and Monica could go off wherever they ended up going together. But how did Olga end up dead? Nick asked. I'm convinced Jason killed her and sunk her in the bottom of the pond, said Bitsy, but how or why, exactly, I don't know. That's for Stan to divulge. She turned to her brother. How am I doing so far? Did I leave anything out? If Monica McCall was hiding out in a motel in Fayetteville, how did she end up there? Stan asked. I suspect it became too risky to leave Monica alone in the cellar. Probably, Olga was getting more insistent about finishing Monica off, and the others were afraid Olga might go down to the farm when no one else was around and do the job herself. Remember, it's possible Olga had no idea anyone besides Jason knew she had anything to do with Monica McCall's disappearance. She'd have had reasonable expectations she could kill Monica, dispose of the body, and never get caught as long as she could prevent Jason from talking. So, Hannah helped Monica find a place to hide out until they could stage her death? Liz asked. That's what I believe, yes. Hannah provided Monica with an untraceable cell phone, so she could communicate with the others and hair dye to make her less likely to be spotted once she'd left the hotel. How did you know it was Monica hiding out in that motel room? Liz asked. We followed Hannah Jameson to the hotel from the store, where we stopped to buy motor oil. I got really suspicious when I saw her purchasing a number of items I thought couldn't possibly be meant for her own use. Like what? She was buying junk food, for a start, Bitsy said. Hannah looks like the type who subsists on organic vegetable juice. The second clue was the hair dye. Hannah has expensive highlights, she'd never ruin them with a bottle of off-the-shelf do-it-yourself hair dye. The third clue was the pay-as-you-go cell phone. Wealthy people don't use those. Not unless they want to make untraceable calls, Stan pointed out. The thing that really convinced me it was Monica in that motel room, Bitsy said, was finding the pizza box with all the cheese left behind. I knew Monica was lactose intolerant. Bitsy paused. No one had made much progress on their Parmesan chicken. It's over to you, Stan, Bitsy said. I'm as curious as everyone else to hear how Olga ended up becoming the murder victim in the end. You understand, Stan said. That nothing I tell you is to leave this room. It will all come out at the trial and in the news, eventually, but if one whiff of it gets out beforehand, it could taint both the investigation and the prosecution. Why are you only looking at me? Bitsy protested. There are two other people sitting around this table. Because you're the only one at this table with an overgrown morbid curiosity, Stan said. Do you promise? I promise. I can't confirm every detail of what Bitsy said up to this point, Stan continued, although it all fits together with what I do know. According to Jason Jameson, and remember, he has a strong motivation to be untruthful, on the day Olga Schmidt died, she called him and told him to meet her out at the farm. Text messages on Jason's phone appear to confirm this story. Jason says up until she'd seen the surveillance footage taken at the ATM after Monica was already supposed to be dead, Olga really believed Jason had killed Monica and disposed of her body by throwing it off the bridge. But why would that cause Jason to murder Olga? Bitsy asked. Jason claims that killing Olga was never his intention, Stan said. He says that after Olga got him to confess to her that he hadn't really killed Monica, Olga pulled a gun on him and threatened to kill him. He tried to wrestle it away from her, and the gun went off, killing her instead. After the shooting, why didn't he call the police and tell them the whole story right from the start? Liz asked. Surely, if Olga was shot with her own firearm, that would lend credence to his story. It might have, said Stan. If Olga had been shot with her own gun, but she wasn't. As far as we know, Olga has never owned a registered firearm. The gun we found in that barrel, along with the body, belongs to Jason. According to Jason, Olga told him she intended to shoot him and make it look like a suicide. She even went so far as to make him draft his own confession and suicide note at gunpoint. 
He said he did it to buy time, but then when she put the gun to his head, he fought back and managed to get the weapon away from her. How did Olga get Jason's gun? Liz asked. Jason claims he was in the habit of keeping it in his glove box, Stan said, and Olga knew he kept it there. Jason surmised Olga took the gun from his parked car while he was occupied with opening the barn door. Do you think he's telling the truth? Bitsy asked. All the evidence supports his story, except for one aspect. There's really no way of knowing if the gun went off accidentally during the struggle or if Jason pulled the trigger on purpose and killed her in cold blood, Stan said. I guess it will be up to a jury to decide. At the very least, Jason should get a false imprisonment conviction for holding Monica captive in that cellar under the barn. There was silence around the table. I'm glad it's all finally over, said Nick. Now, Bitsy can stop worrying. By worrying, you mean meddling? Bitsy teased. I never said anything about meddling, Nick protested. I can't stop worrying, said Bitsy. Not yet. Not until Dale and Monica are safely back home. The next morning Bitsy called Gwen and begged her to have Monica contact her if she called. Please write a message down from me, Bitsy said. Please tell her exactly this, the next time you hear from her, say, the big blonde witch is dead, and her frog prince has been arrested. Call Bitsy. Gwen was befuddled, but she agreed to pass the message on. Clearly, she hadn't yet heard the news of Olga's death, it certainly hadn't been reported in the media, although the news had gotten out that the body of an unidentified woman had been removed from the bottom of the pond on the old Marson farm. Is this some kind of code? Gwen asked. Yes, said Bitsy, and left it at that. Have you decided about buying into InstaWealth 365 yet? Gwen asked. I'll be sure to do it at the very next opportunity, Bitsy said, fully confident there would never be one. Olga was dead, and Jason was likely going to prison. InstaWealth 365 was going under. In a way, Monica had succeeded, although Bitsy was certain this was not the method Monica would have chosen, could she have seen the end from the beginning. Gwen was probably never going to see her $100,000 again. After hanging up with Gwen, Bitsy browsed Monica's blog and visited all her linked social media accounts. Half an hour later, Bitsy had figured out which village in Baja, California, the McCalls had been visiting the last couple of winters. She combed through the pictures Monica had posted of their annual visits. They seemed to have stayed in the same house for the last few years. Bitsy saved every image, showing what might be the interior of the place that she could find. Next, she perused the house for rent listings for the village on every vacation rental site she could think of. It took her a while, but she finally found a house whose interior photographs matched the details in photos Monica had posted of her and Dale enjoying their annual Mexican vacations. The listing indicated the owner spoke English. Bitsy brought up the messaging function on the website and typed in a message. I'm trying to reach Monica and Dale McCall. They may be your guests right now. There is a family emergency. Please ask them to contact Bitsy George immediately. Bitsy included her number, thanked the recipient homeowner for her time, and hit send. Late in the afternoon, back at the bakery, Bitsy was taking the mixer paddle out of a bowl of chocolate buttercream frosting when her phone rang. Bitsy, said the voice on the other end. It's Monica. Are you all right? Is Dale there with you? We're perfectly fine. How in the world did you find us? I can tell you all about it later, but for right now, I just wanted to make sure you knew it was safe for you to come home. We know about Olga, Monica said. Gregory has been in contact with us through the whole ordeal. He told us we'd probably better call the Little Creek Police Department and let them know we are no longer missing persons. I expect they're going to want to ask you and Dale a lot of questions when you get home, Bitsy said. When are you coming back? We have a reservation for another week, said Monica, but, under the circumstances, I think we'll come back tomorrow. I don't know how I'm going to break it to my mother that I lied about Dale being dead. When I found out she'd been chattering away about things I'd specifically asked her to keep under her hat, 
I knew I couldn't afford to tell her the truth. I have no idea how many people she told about me supposedly leaving Dale. Well, she told me for a start, said Bitsy. When you're back, safe and sound, we'll have coffee and cupcakes together, and you'll have to tell me all about your adventure, start to finish. Thank you, said Monica. For what? Bitsy asked. Gregory told me you'd been very helpful. If you hadn't found Seth and hadn't figured out Olga was dead, things might have dragged on far longer. Oh, it was nothing, really, Bitsy said. You were the brave one, pretending to die like that, just to throw Olga off the scent. If I could have come up with a better plan to guarantee Gregory's kids were safe, I suppose you know she threatened to run off with the kids every time Gregory crossed her? I do know about that, said Bitsy. I can't imagine what she'd have been capable of doing if she'd have found out any earlier that all of us were conspiring to deceive her. She flew off the handle completely when she discovered Jason had let me go free. Attempted murder certainly does count as flying off the handle, Bitsy said. Do you think her kids are going to be all right? She may have been a horrible woman, but she was still their mother. In the end, Monica said, they will be far better off growing up without her, although I'm sure it's going to be rough for a while. There was a full minute of silence as, on their respective ends of the line, Bitsy and Monica contemplated the whole distressing scenario. Well, Monica said at last. We've got tickets to come home on Tuesday. I'll let you know when things settle down, and we can get together and debrief. Bitsy hung up and looked down at the mixer paddle she held in her hands. It was coated in chocolate buttercream frosting. Normally, she'd scrape it down and throw the paddle into the pile of utensils and baking pans sitting in the sink for washing and sterilization. Bitsy didn't do that this time, instead, she licked the whole thing clean. Then she went out to the front room where Nick was washing the large plate glass windows facing the street. The tables were empty. Nick stood framed in a slanting beam of the late afternoon sun. He turned around and stood there smiling broadly at Bitsy, looking far more handsome than any man had a right to look while wearing an apron emblazoned with the words, It's cupcake o'clock. You have chocolate all over your face, he said. Oh, said Bitsy. I'll go wipe it off. Don't do that, Nick said. Come here. Nick put down his bottle of window cleaner and his wad of paper towels. Then he took her head in his hands and kissed off every bit of the errant chocolate. Better, he said, letting her go. Bitsy nodded her head. I came out to tell you, she said, I've located Monica and Dale, and they'll be coming home on Tuesday. Does that mean I'll be getting to see more of you? Nick asked. Can our dates not be skulking around abandoned farms and staking out seedy motels? Sure, I'll be on my very best behavior. Until the next time you allow your morbid curiosity to get the best of you, Nick said, well, never mind, I'll take what I can get. Then he kissed her again. The End